Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. This is your host, Adam Graham, from more or less the present day. And we are bringing you, in this YouTube video, a week of archive programs from the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Now, these were recorded several years ago, are being posted exactly as they were, Except I am cutting the opening for all but the first episode to exclude the theme music and as much front matter as I can. And then also cutting down the end to remove some of that contact information. Now any specific offers or deals offered on the podcast are not actually valid unless they are shown on our current website at greatdetectives.net. This video does contain chapters, so if you don't want to listen to all of the programs in the week, you can skip around the ones that you want to listen to just like the original listeners did. Now it's time for our archive programs. to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. Well, I was uh, getting ready. I, I thought I'd actually finished recording every episode of Great Detectives of Old Time Radio for 2009. Uh, and then I took just a little preview lesson of this week's episode, and I realized I had last week's commentary. So, needed to get something up. So, re-listen to that episode, because it had been a few weeks since I had listened. Um, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. So we'll just go ahead and get into it. The, the title of today's episode is Double Mothers. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind you to please cast your vote. Uh, go to podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Um, and always remember, feel free to email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. But without any further ado, let's get into today's episode, Double Mothers. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. They stood in the warm rays of the autumn sun while the wind played in the girl's hair. Oh, no, not that. Susie. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Oh, no, not what? I'm referring to the story I'm writing. Better forget the story, Mr. Holliday. I've got mail for you. So? What's new in Box 13? Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Let's see. Where was I? Oh. But Betty forgot her dignity as she fell and bumped her head against the tree which stood nearby. Oh, brother. Mr. Holliday. What's that, Susie? I said that maybe the mail from Box 13 might give you an idea. Today there were two letters. Two? Yes, mm mm-hmm. One of them is a big, fat envelope. Now, who in the world would send me a big, fat envelope? The police department. It's a block of tickets for their annual ball. What's the other one? 
Mmm, this one smells all romantic-like. It has the odor of Christmas night. Or, uh, maybe it's Easter morn. Or maybe it's Tuesday afternoon. Here, let's have it. Hmm. If you will really do anything, what I have to ask is very, very little. Please meet me in North Park at 10 o'clock tonight. I'll be waiting at the bench near the entrance to the bridle path. Signed, Anonymous. It couldn't have been very romantic, Mr. Holliday. Oh, why not, Susie? I don't see stars in your eyes. Well, take another look, Susie. Tonight at 10 o'clock. An anonymous note. A rendezvous in the park at night. Well, I must admit it's better than the yarn I was riding. At least it's got a good start. The question is, what's the ending? Well, this is the park, and the clock says ten. There's the bench at the end of the bridle path. And that's all there is. Hey, wait a minute. Is that? No, it couldn't be. A little girl, sound asleep, nobody else around. What's she doing out here alone this time of night? Little girl. Wake up, little girl. Wake up. Oh, I'm sorry. The sandman came when I was supposed to stay awake. Now, what are you doing here? Waiting. Well, aren't you cold? No, I'm not cold. I have a nice new coat. See? <laughs> yes, it's very pretty. But for whom are you waiting? I'm waiting for the man. What man? He comes out of a box. It has a number. Oh, no. You don't mean box 13? Yes, that's it. How did you know? Because I'm the man. Oh, I'm so glad. You're nice. Oh, I like you a lot. Well, thanks. Who told you about the man from box 13? One of my mothers. Mothers? You've got more than one? Of course, I got two. You're a very remarkable little girl. How do you happen to have two mothers? I don't know. Just happened, I guess. What's your name? Janie. I mean, uh, what's your other name? I promised I wouldn't tell. Now, whom did you promise? My mother. Oh, your mother. Uh, the first one or the second one? The first one, naturally. Forgive me, I, I'm so stupid tonight. Where do you live, Janie? Oh, I said two homes and... I couldn't find either one. Mm, that's great. Look, Janie, what are you going to do? I'm going with you because I like you, and I promised I would. Mm, so that's it. Oh, no, you're not. I'm going to take you to the police station. My mother said you wouldn't. Why wouldn't I? My mother said you were a nice man who was smarter than any policeman ever was. Janie... Flattery will get you nowhere. What flattery? That's something you've probably already learned from your mother. Now, do you know where you live? Sure, I live in the house. And do you know where the house is? Well, first you have to walk down this block to Jack Black's drugstore. Well, come on. And then if we get to the drugstore, we turn left and walk a block. Oh, that's where you live? No, no. That's the corner where Johnson's toy shop is. Now, Janie. And then we turn right and go two blocks. <sighs> That's home. That's where the ice cream parlor is. Now, stop that, Janie, and tell me how to get to your home. Well, you walk half a block up that street. That's home. Oh, that's your home. No, that's David's home. Hmm. So you're not going to tell me where you live, is that it? I think maybe you'd better look at my book first. It's grim fairy tales. Only they're not grim at all. They're nice. You want me to read to you? At 10 o'clock at night? You know, young lady, it's way past your bedtime. No. No, I want you to read the letter that's in my book. Mommy said to tell you about it. Letter? Here, let me see uh -huh. that. Well, how do you like this? Please take care of my little Janie for me. I shall communicate with you in a little while. Let no one, even the police, take her away. Believe me when I say you're doing nothing illegal. Just helping out. Her mother. Hmm. 
him. I, I like his voice. What's your name? Dan. A sucker if there ever was one. Well, this is not good. A small girl left in your care with no more authority than a letter. Suppose the woman who wrote this letter isn't Janie's real mother. Hmm. Then, Holiday, you're in trouble. But suppose she is the real mother. Why should she leave her child with a perfect stranger? Why? Well, there's only one thing to do. Take her to your apartment. Come on, Janie girl. Let's go. Let's hope that the neighbors won't see you bringing home a little girl. Because that happens to be one item you don't win at a bingo game. Put it down on the couch, Holiday. Hmm, that's it. Never knew a kid could have so much strength in her arms, did you? Uh, feels kind of good, too. Better get a blanket to put over. Better yet, stupid, put her in your bed. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're sleeping on the couch tonight. I wonder who she is and what this is all about. Hello? Dan Holiday? Yes? The man from Box 13? Yes? How's my little girl? Did you get home all right? How did you get my phone number? That's not important. How do you know who I am? Please, how is my little girl? Well, she's asleep. Oh, thank heavens. I heard the bell ringing. Uh, she just woke up. Is she all right? She's fine, but... I'm on a fairy tale. Just a minute, honey. How long will it take you to get over here? Oh, I can't come over there now. I'm afraid to. Uh, lady, which mother are you? I don't understand you. She says she's got two. I'm her real mother. Well, then get over here and take her. I can't explain now, but please, Mr. Holiday, keep her just for a few days. A few days? And don't give her up to anyone, not even the police. Now, how do I know this is on the level? You don't. You'll just have to trust me. I promise you, you'll never regret it. I don't like any part of this, except Janie. You'll understand soon, Mr. Holiday. And remember, be very careful. Both Janie and you are in danger. You're right, our holiday. How do you like this plot? A mother gives a little girl to a strange man, warning him not to give the child up to anyone. Not even the police. And then she admits there's danger. <laughs> Janie. I broke the nail. I broke the nail. Oh, that's all right, baby. Are you hurt? I didn't mean to. I wanted my bed to poop. No, don't cry, honey. That was a nasty old lamp anyway. All it did was throw off a lot of light. No, Janie. My daddy ran away when I was a baby. Why can't you be my daddy? Mm. It's getting late, honey. Aren't you sleeping? Not anymore. Read me a fairy tale, Daddy. In the morning, Janie. Now, you'd better get to bed. Have you got a doll? No, I'm sorry. No doll. Daddy Bear? No teddy bear. You must be awful lonesome. Maybe you've got something there, little lady. Daddy? Hmm? Tell me a fairy story. All right, honey. Let's see now. Once upon a time, there were three bears. The papa bear, the mama bear, and, and the... the ba baby bear. I know that story. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Red Riding Hood. And, and the... the wolf ate up her grandmother. I know that one, too. Uh, Janie, maybe you should tell me the stories. Oh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack who planted a bean seed. And it grew up into a mighty tall vine. And, and he, he climbed into the sky and killed a bad giant. I know that one, too. Saved by the bell. Hello, Holiday. Oh, Lieutenant Kling. Holiday, you're in a jam. Lieutenant Kling of the police department doesn't drop in on people unless there's trouble. Watch your step, boy. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Come in, Lieutenant. Oh, that's better. Uh, anything wrong? Well, that's what I dropped in to find out. 
When you stay out of the department's hair for more than two weeks, I begin to worry. Hmm. Haven't been doing a thing, Lieutenant. Not a thing. Besides, I want to know if you got those tickets to the ball. Hello. <laughs> well, what's this? A little girl. Oh, thanks, Oliver. Uh, what's your name, young lady? Vicky. Uh, uh, Vicky Preston. Oh, no, it isn't. It isn't? Uh, holiday. Great little kid. Her dandy sense of humor likes to pretend she's somebody else. <laughs> All children do. Who is he, Daddy? Daddy? Holiday, my boy. See what I mean? Who is he, Daddy? He's a cop. A policeman, honey. Lieutenant Kling. Oh, I like policemen. And I like little girls. Got two of them myself. Is the writing business slow these days, Holiday? How do you mean? Oh, I thought you might be picking up a few bucks babysitting. Oh, Oh, yes, just helping out a friend. I could use you sometime. My wife and I like to get out every now and then. What's your price to sit with my kids? That depends. Uh, are your children anything like you? No, Holiday. Oh, I'm just asking, just asking. Glad to accommodate any time. Yep, see you around, Holiday. Yeah, I'll see you. Your hand is shaking. Never mind, Jane. It's time you went to sleep. There's something about a kid asleep. Maybe I'm glad this happened. Hmm. Got to use more kids in my stories after this. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have one around all the time. What am I saying? Now what? Lay off. You'll wake the kid. You Dan Holiday? Yeah, that's right. And I'd like to come inside and talk with you. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk out in the doorway. Very well, I'll, I'll be direct. You have a little girl here named Janie, about five years old? Why? My name is Sam Parker. That mean anything? No. I've got a letter here authorizing me to take the little girl away. You're her father? Read the letter, then hand over the child. No. Very well, I'll call the police. I wish you would. Can I use the phone down the hall? I'm sorry about this. But get inside, then. Keep your hands over your head. Put down that gun. What do you think you're pulling? Right, shut up and get inside. Oh, there she is. Put down that gun, I said. He comes with me, Holiday. Just keep those hands high. And I said you're staying here. Move over to that wall. Stay away from her, I said. One more move and you think so. Harry! Harry, help! Hit him with the gun, Harry, now! I got him. <laughs> You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Nice going, Holliday. Very nice. You advertise in the newspaper for adventure, and you get a little girl. Then you lose her to a man with a gun. You don't even know the mother's name or where she is. Now what? Mr. Holliday, I'm Wanda Parker, Janie's mother. Is she all right? You're the woman who called me on the phone? Yes. My baby, where is she? You're a fine one to be asking that after you leave her alone on the park bench. I was there hiding. I saw you take... Where is she? You shouldn't have let her go in the first place. Mr. Holliday, where is she? She's not here. Not here? What have you done with my daughter? You're her real mother? Of course I am. Where is she? What's happened? A man came in. And you let him take the child? I'm sorry. There was nothing I could do. He had a friend and a gun. They knocked me out. When I came to, Janie was gone. This, this man, did he have black hair and very thick eyebrows? Yes, he said his name was Parker. Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. Mr. Holliday, we've got to get her back right away. Before I do anything, you're going to tell me a few things. Then we'll decide. Who's that? I don't know. Right now, I wouldn't even care to guess. Is there a back door? Can I get out without being seen? Yeah, through the kitchen. There's a door leads out into the hall. What are you afraid of? Holliday, open the door. Do you know who that is? Yes, yeah, a police officer, Lieutenant Kling. You must be seen. I'll call you later. All right, all right, I'm coming. What took you so long to open the door? Uh, can't a man get some sleep? With your shoes on? My feet are cold. Get inside. All right, Miss Hatton. Are you sure this is the man, Lieutenant? 
Do you think he could have taken Janie away? I'm not sure of anything, but what you told me, he's just the type that could dream up a little nightmare like this. Lieutenant, mind telling me what this is all about? Oh, I'm Mrs. Hatton, and I'm Janie's mother. I want her right this minute. Janie's mother? You're Janie's mother? Lieutenant Kling, if this man has my little Janie, make him give her up right this minute. Come on, Holiday, where is she? Or who? You know what I want, that little girl you had here half an hour ago. Janie Parker. Me? I had a little girl? Up here? Holiday. Yes, Lieutenant? I came up here to see you. I was worried about you. I didn't know how right I was. And I appreciated your interest. Shut up. When I came up here, there was a little girl around. Now, where is she? Cling. You have my word. I, I don't know. Maybe you could remember down at headquarters. I can't remember something I didn't know in the first place. He doesn't look like the type who would have taken Janie. Oh, thank you. Now, Mrs. Hatton, if you'd tell me what this is all about, maybe I could help you. My little girl disappeared tonight. I was frantic. I called the police. I got the report right after I dropped here to see you, Holiday. From the description, I'd say you had Janie Parker right here. But you're not sure. Maybe you'd like to prove to me where you got the little girl I saw up here, eh? Come on, come on, tell me. Lieutenant, you'd never believe me. Then where is that little girl now? Can you tell me that? No, I can't. But suppose I produced the girl and you found out it wasn't the same one. Holiday, what are you driving at? I just want a chance to produce the girl. How about it, Kling? I think you're pulling another one of your fast shenanigans. I ought to lock you up. But I'm inclined to give you a chance. What kind of a chance? I'm giving you three hours to find that little girl. Three hours? Then I'll be back, Holiday. So don't try anything funny. Lieutenant, at the moment, I have practically no sense of humor left. At least you're not in jail, Holiday. The good lieutenant walked out with Mrs. Hatton. You're as free as a bird on the wing for three hours. If you were as smart as that bird, you'd wing out of town until this blows over. Mr. Holiday. You. They've gone. You've been listening? Yes, at the kitchen door. Now, look, if you're Janie's mother and Mrs. Hatton is Janie's Mr. mother... Mr. Holiday, can... there's no time to explain. Wait a minute. Then who is Sam Parker? He's not Sam Parker. He's... He's Sam Clark. Oh, I see. Because Janie has two mothers, Sam Parker turns out to be Sam Clark. What are you giving me? I can clear up the whole thing, but we've got to get Janie away from Sam Clark first. Otherwise, I may never see her again. How do you go about finding a man named Sam Clark in a city this size? He doesn't live here. But I heard he drove his car down. That means he's probably staying at Brown's Motel. Uh-huh. I think I'll drop out and pay him a visit. I'll go with you. No, no, I don't think that's wise. I'm going alone. But Mr. Holliday... He carries a gun. You stay here. You'll get her. You'll bring Janie back. I'll try my best. I'll be waiting. After that, I'll spend a quiet weekend with a psychiatrist. This is it. Brown's Motel. Now to find a man named Sam Clark or Sam Parker. Ask the manager. That's logical. So he is here. Well, what do you do now, Holiday? You knock on the door, Sam Clark will stick a gun in your ribs. There'll be a fight and Janie might get hurt. The telephone. That's how to do it. Remember to thank the man who invented outdoor phone booths. Better be right, Holiday. Because if you're wrong, you're dead. And that's so permanent. Brown's Motel. I want to speak to Mr. Clark. I don't know. He, he said he didn't want to be disturbed. It's a matter of life and death. Get into the phone. Uh, who is this? Hurry, man. I've only got a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll see. Now, quick, Holiday. Out of the booth and around the corner towards the back. Wait. Now. Take it easy. Here he comes. Now, Holiday, just step around to the side of the booth where you won't be seen. Hello? 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 What kind of gag is this? No gag at all, Mr. Clark. Oh. That'll take care of him long enough for me to straighten this all out. Honey, I want you to tell me the truth. You know what the truth is? Of course 
course I do, Daddy. Now tell me quickly, that man who brought you here, is he your real daddy? Oh, no. He's not my real daddy. Besides, I don't like him. Well, come on, Janie. We're getting out of here right now. I hope that's Lieutenant Kling and Mrs. Hatton. So, Holiday, you brought her back. Yeah, I, I brought her back. Oh, Janie, my baby. Mommy! Oh, I thought I'd lost you. I thought I'd never see you again. Mr. Holiday, I saw these people come in. Did you... Jamie. Mommy! Jamie! No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. What is this? These are my two mummies. Holiday, would you mind explaining this little two-mother soiree you've cooked up? Lieutenant, I think you'd better listen to what Mrs. Parker has to say. I'd like to listen to anyone who can make sense out of this highly confusing little situation. Anyone but you, Holiday. Thanks. Go on, Mrs. Parker. She's Janie's mother. Well, then, who are you, Mrs. Hatton? Kling, let Mrs. Parker explain, will you? Yes, please do, Mrs. Parker. My husband's been dead for some time. I've been working out of town so I could take care of Janie. I placed her in a foundling home for the year I'd be gone. And I'm a foster mother, Lieutenant. The foundling home paid me to take care of Janie. But you two have never met, eh? That's right, Kling. Is it beginning to make sense? No. If neither of these two ladies had the child, who did? A man named Sam Parker who turned out to be... Sam Clark. Holiday, will you cut that out? Sam Clark is my husband's cousin. He's been trying to take Janie away from me legally. That bothers me, Mrs. Parker. Why would he do that? Because there's an inheritance coming to her from her grandparents. He hopes to prove me negligent and get her custody. That way he can control the estate. And that's where I came. You see, I took Janie from Mrs. Hatton's house. I wanted to hide her. I read Mr. Holiday's ad. I gave her to him. You gave her a child, a Holiday? Oh, lady, you didn't know what you were doing. No, no, just to keep until it was safe, until I could get matters straightened out with the court. Well, now I'm beginning to see the light. Uh, you satisfied, Mrs. Hatton? Of course. I'd never try to keep Janie from her mother. Mm, thank heaven for that. So I guess it's all wound up, eh, Holiday? Oh, no, not yet. There's more. Holiday, if you've got one more ramification up that sleeve of yours... I could hardly get Sam Clark up my sleeve. But I've got a hunch he should be here any minute. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Answer that door, Holiday. I'd suggest a gun in your hand, Lieutenant. A gun? What for? Oh, don't ask silly questions. Come in, Mr. Clark. Get your hands up. We've got something to settle. Meet Lieutenant Kling of the police department. What? No. Oh. <laughs> That's a nice right you've got, Holiday. Uh, pick up this gun. Thanks, Lieutenant. It's a pleasure. Mr. Holiday, how can I ever thank you? Very easily. Just bring little Janie up to see me occasionally. I certainly shall. Oh, by the way, I have a suggestion for you two ladies. I think I know how you can both keep Janie. But how? What do you mean, Mr. Holiday? Suppose you, Mrs. Parker, continue with your work. Janie could stay at Mrs. Hatton's, and so could you. Oh, Mrs. Parker, if you only would. I think that's simply wonderful. Mommy. Yes? He fixed it so I can keep my two mommies, didn't he? Yes, he did, darling. Would you be my real daddy? Well, now, Janie, you see, it's like this. I... <laughs> Let's see you get out of that holiday. <laughs> and would you tell me a fairy story? Oh, no, you don't catch me on that one. I'll write you one. Mr. Holiday, I think you ought to know that... Oh, what a cute little girl. Who are you, little girl? I'm Janie, and this is my daddy. Why, Mr. Holiday, you never told me. Now, look, Susie, Janie means I'm her daddy. Well, just sort of imaginary. What's imaginary about being a father? Sit down, Susie. I'll tell you all about it. I'm going to tell you a story. Boy, oh boy. I'll bet this is going to be good. Next week, same time, Ellen Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Lad appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hedegar. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. What?
welcome back. You know, th it's this type of episode that can be a little bit challenging uh, with Alan Ladd. And there are a few episodes uh, where Ladd, I have to admit, I've not seen a whole lot of Ladd's work um, on film. But listening to some of these episodes, pretty much all that there is to do at the end uh, of some of these shows is just to go, <laughs> applause, way to go, Dan Holiday. And that's about it. Uh, fantastic performance all the way through. I think this showed a, a side of, Hol of Holiday that we hadn't seen. Really uh, some good ten um, good tenderness here. I was curious um, if the, if the uh, uh, actor who played the child really was a child. Because usually they didn't have uh, actual children in old time radio. Uh, whoever it was, they did a great job um, and really just created a very uh, a very different Box 13. A lot of emotion and heart uh, went into it. Um, so just a fantastic performance all around, and we're going to hear a lot more of that from Dan Holiday in coming weeks. So all from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you Pat Novak for Hire. This episode, I think, is a very, uh, th this is actually a pretty key episode. Heretofore, we've seen um, uh, Pat Novak get his uh, head beaten in time and time again for only one reason. His, um, um, his greed and willingness to basically follow the money to go beyond his better judgment. Uh, this episode, I think, is notable just because of the uh, of the change in uh, motivation, um, and I, I think it's it's just such a great episode for character development. Um, I think you're going to enjoy it just as much as I did. Um, before we do get started, I want to first of all encourage you. Got any comments on the show? Please email me box13 at greatdetectives.net. Um, also. Uh, also, please cast your vote for us on Podcast Alley. Uh, there's a link at the show notes site, greatdetectives.net. You can click to go and vote for us. Uh, or if you put uh, Great Detectives of Old Time Radio in the search engine, Podcast Alley is one of the top results that will come up for you. Um, and also, I, I want to encourage you uh, to, uh, to please go and to uh, check out our great host, uh, One and One. Uh, you know, it takes a lot to have confidence to put uh, to put a show up on a website. You got to know the server's going to be there. It's going to be reliable. You can trust uh, that the that each episode is going to be accessible. And that's what I like about One and One. It has got great storage space at great prices and unlimited downloads, unlimited bandwidth. So you don't have to worry. What if the show gets too popular? What are we going to do? Uh, with one and one, we can trust that there's not going to be any limit on on how much this show will be able to grow in popularity. Uh, and so I use it, and I encourage you to use it as well. Go to uh, hosting.greatdetectives.net, hosting.greatdetectives.net, and try it out today. Now, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into today's episode, Father Leahy. Pat Novak, for hire. Sure. I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak, for hire. It's about the only way to say it. 
No, you can dress it up and tell how many shopping days there are till Christmas. But if you got yourself in the market, you can't waste time talking. You gotta be as brief as a pauper's will. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, everybody wants a piece of the cake. And the only easy buck is the one you just spent. Oh, it's a good life. And if you work real hard and study a little on the side, you gotta trade by the time you get to prison. I rent boats and do a few other odd jobs you can't afford to pick it on. Works out all right if you put your tongue in hock. Because down here you shouldn't talk. It's like installing a set of drums in a belfry. You make some noise, but it's never the right kind. I found that out a few days ago. Must have been Tuesday or Wednesday night. Anyway, I was sitting in the office reading Time magazine when the door opened. I looked up and had to keep right on going because the guy was so tall he'd have to bend over to see through a transom. And he had a voice deep enough to read out as a bassoon. Good evening, Mr. Novak. I'll take your word for it. You have a small office. I'm small time. What's on your mind? My name is Leahy. I want to hire you. Yeah. Sit down. Are you cold? Yeah. That overcoat around your neck, you're either cold or a priest. Oh. I'm a priest, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry, Father. You got a slow brogue. What do you need? A few hours of your time. I want you to help a man escape from prison. Uh Uh-huh. Father, you'll never get along with a bishop. Mr. Novak, in a curious way, this is an errand of mercy. Well, this isn't my year for mercy. I'm sorry, Father. Maybe you don't like to hear it that way, but if I got the right fee, it wouldn't be mercy anymore. When I say it's an errand of mercy, that's what it is. Sometime tonight, a man is going to break out of Alcatraz. If he's allowed to get into town, he may kill somebody. You want me to stop him? That's right. And if he doesn't kill anybody, he can still be shot down by the police. Well, that's the percentage, Father. If he comes off that rock, he knows that. Stop worrying about him. If you could bring him to me, I know I can talk him into going back. Tell headquarters they'll do the same thing. If I did that, I'd break a promise. This is the only thing I can do. Will you help me? Yeah, I suppose. How do I pick him up? Tread water in the bay he comes by? He's due in at Pier 19 sometime tonight. When he comes ashore, bring him to me. I'll be waiting at the ferry building. Well, suppose he doesn't want to come. Suppose he wants to party. How am I going to get him there? I don't ask you how to say the beads. If you're any good, you'll get him there. But you don't want him in sections. I want him all at once, Mr. Novak. I wouldn't ask you this if it weren't important. But i got to help him. He's one of my boys. Yeah, sure. What's his name? Joe Feldman. Feldman? Yeah. If I don't worry about the spelling, you don't have to either. He's one of my boys. Slow down. Nobody's pushing your father. I don't know when he's due, but I'll be at the ferry building from 8 o'clock on. Yeah, I only got one worry. Uh-huh. Is there really a guy named Father Leahy? Well, I suppose you'll have to take a chance on that. Yeah, well, it's a big chance. You come in here with a story anybody can see through like a screen door and I'm supposed to buy it. You could dig up a collar. What happens if you're a fake? Just try to guess right. Suppose I don't. Then you're in the same spot Pontius Pilate was. Good night, Mr. Novak. Joe Feldman was, he had a good friend. Because when Father Leahy walked out of there, I knew he was all right. You could tell without even testing him. The way when you pick up a pool cue, you know right away whether it's any good or not. He stood at the door for a minute, and then he walked out. And you got a funny feeling that he didn't walk into the night that he was big enough to wrap it around his shoulders and take it with him. I got a last look at him as he turned the corner under a street lamp. He looked even taller now. And you knew if somebody stood him in an oil field, you couldn't tell him from the rest of the derricks. Well, I made a couple of phone calls, and then I closed shop and went down to the end of Pier 19 to wait. The bay looked as dark as a bruised crow. The fog was beginning to drift in over near the piers. By 9 o'clock, you couldn't see a thing. You felt like a guy trying to shave in a bathroom full of steam. I was about 30 feet from the end of the pier when a small boat pulled in and let somebody out. I was sure it was my boy, so I moved behind his shed and waited. The boat pulled away, and the guy started down the dock. I waited until he moved past me. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. You ought to be glad. How's the rock? Huh? You lonely, mister? What do you care? If you ought to buy a beer and talk to the bartender, I'm busy. All right, you're tough, Feldman. Let's go now. You got dates for us? You're going to see Father Leahy. Come on. Are you doubling for Gabriel? Leave me alone, mister. I don't want to go. Now, look, Junior, if we draw straws, you're going to get the short one. Oh. There's supposed to be a gun in your pocket? You get a chance to find out. That's what I'm going to do, because I have one, too. If it starts to hurt your stomach, back down. (laughs) Now, where's yours, Mr. Timmett? (laughs) It's a bad night for bluffing, so goodbye. Yeah, come here. (laughs) Oh. 
Go easy, fellas. It's a big one. Well, you can let go easy then. Come on, drop it. Drop it in the water. Let go. Now, you want to start again? No. Well, I'll see you, man, lady. I got to make a stop first. Make it after. It'll take five minutes. Look, mister, if you want to do it the easy way, let me make the stop. You go with me. All right, five minutes, and then you see Father Leahy. Suit yourself. I doubt if I'll make heaven, but if you want to run interference, it's all right with me. If you need the credits, you need the credits. Joe Feldman wasn't very friendly. He sat over in the corner of the cab, and he didn't say a thing. He just kept looking at me and waiting, like a guy feeding arsenic to a rich aunt. A few minutes later, the cab pulled up in front of a hotel on Geary Street, and we walked in. One look at that lobby, and you got the idea. The place was about as cozy as an abandoned mine shaft. Over by the wall, there was an old mohair couch, and the legs on it were so warped, pretty soon it was going to look like period furniture. There were a few chairs, and... Over by the stairs, a faded calendar of a girl in tights holding a jar of mayonnaise and winking, whatever that meant. And there was a broken clock over the desk. But you knew it was all right, because nobody there cared about keeping track of time. It was something you got rid of in a hurry, like a bent quarter. When we went up to the second floor, we walked down a long hall that smelled like an ante room to a sewer. When Feldman knocked on the door, she opened it right away. The room was full of taboo. She stood leaning there for a minute, the sort of a girl who moves when she stands still. She had blonde hair. She was kind of pretty, except she could see somebody had used her badly, like a dictionary in a stupid family. Feldman seemed to know her. Hello, Ann. Well, the harvest hands arrive all at once. Yeah. It's good for the crops, but tough on a woman. Come in. Who's your friend? A missionary, I guess. He grabbed me down by the docks. Does he talk or just stand there looking healthy? He growls a little. Do you really growl? Come on, hurry up, lady. Your friend's got a date. I'll bet you bite instead. <laughs> Don't worry about him. He can go over in a corner and play fifth wheel. Now, look, he's got five minutes. Use him quick. Yeah? I uh, came up with a message, Ann. The time's been changed. Stay around till 10 o'clock. All right. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. You want the other four minutes? Let's go. All right. Open the door. Yeah. You didn't open it fast enough. When Feldman hit me, I wobbled for a minute and went down like the price of winter wheat. Father Leahy had any loose prayers lying around. Now was the time to crate them up and ship them over because I wasn't going to stay awake long enough to test the varnish. I rolled on the floor a couple of times and then I took a rain check on the next couple of hours. When I woke up, it was like buying a new Nash and then finding out you can't drive. Joe Feldman was lying next to me with his throat cut like a pound of rib roast. His head was over to one side and his body was twisted over the other way as if he couldn't make up his mind which direction to die in. I got up and rolled him on his back. He was grinning like a Pullman porter at the end of the line, and his mouth was half open as if he expected you to drop in a suggestion on your way by. I noticed right then how thin and small he was, about as fat as a shadow and tall enough to scrape his head on a lampshade. Well, there wasn't anything I could do but wish him luck. So I called the check stand at the ferry building and had them page Father Leahy. About two minutes later, he answered. Hello, Father Leahy? This is Novak, Father. Yes? Call in the outfield. Your boy's dead. I see. What happened? Somebody didn't like him lots. I wasn't around for the main event. Where are you, on the pier? No, I'm in some cave up on Geary Street. He wanted to come by here first. Father, who's Ann? I don't know. Has Feldman got a girlfriend? He's got two sisters, I think. One of them's named Ann. A tall blonde with lots of speed? That's your definition, but it'll probably do. Now, she was around for a while, in case you ever want to check. What are you going to do? Get on the back stairs and pretend I never heard of Joe Feldman. So am I, Father. If you liked him, I'm sorry. He may have been a nice little guy. Huh? Well, I could do without him, but if you like it, I'll say he was a good little guy. How little? I don't know. We could start a picket fence with him. Why? Because you've got the wrong man, Mr. Novak. Huh? If he's under six feet, you've got the wrong man. Whoever you've got up there, it isn't Joe Feldman. Well, he's happy about it now, Father. Whoever he is, I'm sorry. It's the percentage. Why the percentage? If it 
This is Joe Feldman. Why? That's the waterfront, Father. If your name's Joe Nobody, you still can't do better than eight to five. At least Joe Feldman was smart. If you're going to get your throat cut, it's a good time to send in a substitute. As soon as Father Leahy hung up, I knew hanging around that hotel was going to be a waste of time, like sending mash notes to a bearded lady. If I couldn't prove the guy was alive, they were going to charge extra down at the desk. And if Hellman down at Homicide ever found out I brought the guy up here, I'd have about as much chance as a bottle of scotch at a cocktail party. So I picked up my hat and started for the door. I looked at him once more, but he wasn't going to say goodbye, so I started out. Boo. Oh. Hello, Hellman. Expecting me, Novak? No, I'd have rolled him first. Yeah. Invite me in. Crash the party, Hellman. You'll be more at home. All right. He sure looks lazy. Who is he? He's supposed to be Joe Feldman. But Feldman let him do the hard work. They must be good friends. You better check. I don't know the guy. Yeah, help me roll him over. Okay. There. Here, here's his wallet. You let me have it. You're going to break your fingernail. Give it here. All right. Yeah. No money in here. You're going to drop the case? Here's his card, Mike Greeley. Oh. Didn't he like you either? You're wearing out the rug, Hellman. I don't know the guy. You brought him up. I checked at the desk. Well, check on who left then. I brought him up here on a phony leave. Why? Because I was hired to tow him around. He liked the room, so we dropped by. And he cut himself shaving? I wasn't around. There was a girl here for the handshakes. Oh. What kind of girl? I don't know, Hellman. How many kinds are there? Her name was Ann. She had a fast pulse. That's all I know. You must know more than that. If you don't, you'll never get a lawyer. I won't need one. You'll save money at least, because you got a real hole this time, Novak. We get a phone tip and find you in the murder room. You got half a story, Hellman. I know, but I'll get the other half. Until then, you're under technical arrest. It's practically the real thing. Oh, you got a technical head, Hellman. I wouldn't tip myself off. Somebody else would. Walk around, Novak, and tire yourself out. Because you'll wind up sitting down. In the meantime, I'll have you tailed. Your men couldn't follow a moose through a revolving door. Now, look, Hellman, I'm going to double back. This guy's a phony lead. I was supposed to meet a guy named Joe Feldman, but he never showed up. He didn't? No. I got a dead copper to prove he did. Your boy, Joe Feldman, killed a sergeant named Grubb at the Gold Rush Club, Club a half hour ago. You better start that walk, Novak. Well, there are two kind of raps you can't ever beat. Cheating a woman with kids and killing a copper. So I knew Joe Feldman could put in for reservations right away. And I knew Hellman would stay with him like a February cold. He'd stay with the whole thing, and I'd have a real tough time explaining. <laughs> I couldn't explain it to myself. What about the message up in that room? Why did the little guy tell Ann to stay until 10 o'clock? Why did he get off at Pier 19 instead of Joe Feldman? Once he got there, what was Feldman doing at the Gold Rush Club, and why did they spot him so fast? Well, it pointed to one thing, a police tip-off, but that's as far as I could go. On the way down, I stopped at the desk, and... I asked the clerk to see the register. He pushed it over toward me. It was a dirty brown thing that looked like an old tortilla somebody had left behind. It didn't do any good. The registration was a phony. Well, I had to do something in a hurry, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man, and he used to be a smart one, too. And still he started chasing a jigger of beer with a glass of whiskey. I finally found him in the Pied Piper room arguing with somebody about the words to Annie Laurie. Ah, Patsy, a drink for Mr. Novak. Something cheap but impressive. Oh, stop it, will you, Jocko? Are you going to be drunk all your life? Yes, it's only a matter of willpower, Patsy. I'm probably the only man in the world who intends to carry a hangover into eternity. Well, stop long enough to give me a hand, will you? I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you can't recognize it, Patsy. You're fuzzy, Jocko. You have the social outlook of a bull with a hot foot, and there's no hope for you because if from time to time a moral feeling does sweep over you, you mistake it for influenza and go to bed. All right, all right. Oh, you try hard enough. You go through the motions, Patsy, but you never get anywhere. You go stumbling through life doing a tight wire act on a rubber band. You're always in the middle. Will you listen to me? It's because there's no variety in your life. You won't allow it. You're a broken-down banjo. Not a very good instrument to begin with. And to make matters worse, you allow everybody to come along and pluck the same string. All right. Are you all through now, Jocko? Yes. You sound angry. I think you have a bad disposition, too. What kind of trouble? Well, 
I tried to help some guy out of prison tonight. You got drunk and thought you were the parole board? No, I did it for a good guy, a priest named Leahy. Yes? The guy was already out, and Father Leahy was trying to hurt him back without getting shot. But this guy Feldman didn't want to play. Another drink will clear this up for me? I picked up the wrong guy. I took him to a Geary Street hotel. I napped a while and I cut him up like a piece of parsley. Sounds like a gruesome hotel. The dead guy's name is Mike Greeley. I don't even know who he is. Well, this is no time to start building a friendship anyway. Uh, who is in the room? Some girl. She may be Feldman's sister. Would she kill a man? Well, if she did, he'd be crushed to death. No, I'm sure somebody else came in that room. You better talk to Feldman. Well, he's a hard man to reach. A sergeant almost made it tonight. Feldman shot his way out of the Gold Rush Club. Hmm, that's one way to get out of a nightclub. Well, Hellman steamed up, so you've got to help me, Jocko. You'd better look up Father Leahy. You'll probably be electrocuted, and if you are, he may have some drag. I want you to go down to the Chronicle Morgue and pull the clips on Joe Feldman, will you? Get everything you can, and then hit the horse parlors. Find out what they know about him, huh? Maybe he's a heavy drinker. I'll check the bar. Jocko, wake up and get on there. If I don't pace Hellman on this thing, I'll be a dead pigeon. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. You might start cooing. Good night, lover. <laughs> As soon as I left Jocko, I went down to the Gold Rush Club on O'Farrell Street. It was a little nightclub where they charge 80 cents for a drink of whiskey that'd kill a redwood. The floor show was just as bad, and the headliner was an oriental dancer whose only talent was a zipper. I sat at the bar, and I tried to pry some talk loose, but they liked the boss. I finally got a hold of a fat waitress who should have been wearing a harness instead of slacks. She told me a little. The owner was a guy named Charlie Giffen. He used to make book with Joe Feldman. She told me that Joe's sister worked at the Gold Rush Club for a while, but she got sick a few months ago and quit. I asked the girl if tonight's shooting was a police plant. She didn't know, but she said that Feldman had been in to see Giffen tonight, and on his way out, he ran into trouble. I gave her five bucks, and she looked hurt as if somebody had given her a plow for Christmas. She showed me where Giffen's office was, and I walked back there. Giffen wasn't there, but the taboo was. Do you have the right door, Mr. Novak? You seem to be in all of them. Do you mind if I lean in the doorway? No, but I'll bet you need shoulder pads by this time. Where's Charlie Giffen? Why? I want to ask him about Joe Feldman. Ask me. I'm his sister. I'll ask you about Mike Greeley. Who killed him? I don't know. Is he dead? Yeah, he couldn't stand the bleeding. He was all right when I left. What were you doing up there? Waiting for Joe. My sister and I were going to meet him up there. Relax, Mr. Novak. Relax for me. No, when people relax for you, they do it on the floor. I was out long enough for homicide to catch up. They want me for Mike Greeley, but I'm going to send him you or Joe. You're forgetting my sister Norma. Should I? For most things, yes. But she was up in that room tonight after me. I'll ask her. Ask her about the money, too. Then you're out in front of me on that. You can see me better that way. Joe had a lot of money on him tonight. With the police out, he wouldn't carry it with him. By now the money's gone, so's Norma. No. Do you know where it is? No. Well, you growl and you bite and you lie. You must have a full day. Sit down, relax. I want to see Giffen. He won't be back tonight. Now lean back. That's it, Patsy. Well, you really want that money. I can split a motive. Can you split it 90-10? If you can't, you better get your breath back. I won't need it. I don't want to talk anymore. Come here and make me stop. Over close. If I get any closer, I'll be on the other side of you. Yes. Patsy, you ought to get time and a half, darling. Hello, Anne. Thought you were coming in to curl up with a good book. Uh, Mr. Novak came by full of questions. This is Charlie Giffen, Patsy. I got some questions for you, too, Giffen. Well, ask him down the bore of this gun. Over by the desk, Novak. Did you lose that knife, Giffen? By the desk. That's it. Where's the money, Novak? I gave her the last report. Where's the money? Joe gave it to somebody. By the Red Cross, mister. <laughs> you got a tender face, Novak. Now get out of this club before I slap on a cover charge. <laughs> three hours, I'd seen more service than a mix master in a cooking school. When I left the Gold Rush Club, I dropped by headquarters. Hellman had nothing to show but his badge. They had a dragnet around the city for Joe Feldman, and they'd lined up the record on the dead guy in the hotel. He'd been a friend of Joe's before his trip to Alcatraz. There wasn't much I could do. If Homicide couldn't find Joe, I couldn't find him. So I looked up Norma Feldman in the phone book. She had an apartment out on the avenues, but when I called, there was no answer. So I tagged by my apartment to see if Jocko had left a message. When I opened...
opened the door, Norma was there, and she had a gun to keep her company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah? I came up here to kill you. Well, if you're Norma, the rest of the family's ahead of you. What's happened to my brother? I don't know. Please, what's happened to him, Mr. Novak? Well, if he killed a cop, he's hiding out. I know he didn't mean to do that, Mr. Novak. Joe's not that way. Somebody told the police he was going to be there. That's why I came up here to see you. Oh, put down the gun, huh? You can't shoot through the tears. <laughs> Mr. Novak, if you know where he is, tell me. Make him give himself up. Make him stop hiding like a small, frightened animal. You look big to that copper. Please. Please find him. <laughs> yeah. Hello, this is Jocko. Yeah. You sound ruffled. Joe Feldman's sister just walked in to kill me. Don't argue. It's the best offer you've had. What'd you find out? Feldman has two sisters. I know. They both go to pieces. The gold rush cop is owned by Charlie Giffen. He owed Joe Feldman $2,000, and the horse people say Joe collected it tonight. Well, that fits in, Jocko. Everybody in town's after that dough. They'll have to look some more. Hmm? I'm out on Arquello Boulevard. Homicide just fished Joe Feldman out of the gutter. If Homicide finished second, he was a lucky guy. He didn't have the dough on him? No. Well, he stashed it somewhere. Then he left it with a woman. Yeah? Because he's got a woman's compact in his pocket, you uh, better hit the sister's place. How do we know he got it there? A woman's compact? If he didn't get it there, Alcatraz is getting too social. <laughs> The minute Jocko hung up, things began to fall into place. But I knew the last piece was going to pinch somebody hard. If the Feldman blood was going to turn bad, Father Leahy was a good man to send in, so I called him. He was out, but I left word for him to get out to Norma Feldman's apartment. Norma and I left, and on the way, we picked up Hellman. When we got out to her place and started up the stairs, we could hear people moving above. There was no point in trying to keep quiet, because Hellman was creeping up the stairs like a stallion with a broken leg. Ah! Yeah, if you got a bomb, touch it off, too, huh? Well, open it, Hellman. Hello, Novak. Did you find the dough, Giffen? You mean my stolen dough? Yeah. Come on, Ann. No, you and Ann better wait. This is Hellman from Homicide. We're leaving. You better move, Novak. Not until you settle a murder rap. Can you pay it off that fast? I can do it on the way to the door. Oh, wait a minute. Point the gun at Hellman. He's official. I can tag you both, so move away, you too, Norma. Ann and I are leaving. Look, Giffen, homicide gobbles up nightclub big shots like you. You're nothing to me, copper. Move away. You got the hammer. Use it and come on through. All right, I will, copper. Hey, yeah, hey what... you need a refill, Giffen. That's right, darling. Hand him your gun. Ann, and you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have taken him out. All right, so they fell out. You better take him for murder, Hellman. You little bum. That leaves you all the money. I can spend it, darling. Well, you better do it fast, then. Eh? Grab him, Hellman. Yeah, yeah I got him. Oh, you can fucking pull both murders. My Grilly and my brother. I'll testify and I'll ride there in a cab on your dough, Giffen. Yeah. Are you going to pose or take me, Hellman? If you're anxious. Sorry about you, Norma. You get nothing out of this, but that's better than I got. Goodbye, Ann. Lots of luck. Thank you, darling. You know what kind. I hope you rock. Come on, Hellman. I'm ashamed of you, Anne. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm ashamed of you, Anne. What you did to Joe, I'm ashamed of you. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm sick, you know that. I didn't know how it was going to work out. Poor Joe was trying to help you when you got greedy. He was trying to help you. That's the only reason he came out. You let this happen. I told you I didn't know how it was going to end. I thought they'd get him and take him back again. There's no good in you, Anne. They couldn't find good in you anywhere. You let that happen to Joe. You stood by and watched him walk into something like that. All right, I stood by. What can we do about it now except weep, and that won't help him. But hating you will. That'll help Joe a little. I'm here at least to hate you for the short time left. Please, Norma. You haven't told you to spend it fast. Well, you better. You better spend it fast. Ask him at the hospital if that isn't so. What do you mean? Ask him out there what you've got. They told him. You ask them what you've got. Ask them what's tearing you to pieces. Ask them, they'll tell you. They'll tell you you've got cancer. Norma, please. They'll tell you cancer. Ask them, they'll tell you you're full of it. Now spend your money. Spend your money and see that it lasts as long as you do. <laughs> <laughs>
Hello, Mr. Novak. Now, did you miss much, Father? No. Feldman luck is running kind of bad tonight. It does for some people, I guess. All they get is unhappiness. They wear it the same way you'd wear a sports coat, only they never seem to get a new one. I'm sorry about tonight, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it's not a smoother world. Yeah. But if it were, you'd be out of a job, Father. See you later. If you get a bad first break, you never run the table. That's what happened to Joe Feldman. Charlie Giffen owed him dough and wouldn't pay up. But Joe didn't care until Norma showed up and told him how sick Ann was, so he decided to collect from Giffen and divide the dough between the girls. Father Leigh, he couldn't stop him. All he could do was try and make it work out. Joe was going to get the dough and meet the girls in that hotel room, but he changed his timetable and sent Mike Greeley up to tell the girls. Giffen showed up there and figured that Mike had tumbled to a double cross, so he killed him. Anne engineered the double cross, but she didn't mean to go that far. She wanted all the dough and tipped off Giffen. He was supposed to turn the dough over to her and then have the police pick up Joe, but Joe got there early. He took the dough away from Giffen and shot the copper on the way out. Giffen followed Joe and killed him out in Arguello, but the dough was gone. He finally tumbled to Norma's place, and that's how her apartment filled up so fast. Well, Hellman asked only one question. What did I get out of all this? Nothing. Father Lay, he offered me 50 bucks, but I didn't want it. Jocko was with me, and he offered to give it to charity. I guess he did, because where Jocko spent it, the drinks aren't worth money. <laughs> Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Welcome back. Uh, there were a number of things uh, interesting in this episode. I had to love the idea um, that um, that uh, that that guy thought Pat Novak was a was a missionary uh, because he was trying to take him to a priest. That should have been a clue to uh, Novak that something was wrong. He's like, boy, these Salvationists are getting. Uh, are getting aggressive. Um, I, I found that th this was this was kind of uh, an interesting priest character because the priest um, you had really here uh, the type of priest that Richard Breen likes to write most the hard boiled priest. Uh, and I didn't necessarily believe there was such a thing until hearing some of Breen's scripts. Uh, and he got, came up with one in um, uh, P. Kelly's Blues uh, that was absolutely uh, tough as nails. Uh, in fact, there was one point in the middle of this, uh, I remember, where the priest was just, you know, the priest was just going so uh, so hard and so f forceful. Novak was like, slow down, nobody's pushing you, Father. And you're like, 
Wow! Pat Novak's telling the priest, calm down. Um, but t to me, I, I think that th this does show Breen's overall um, a soft spot for, uh, uh, for for the Catholic Church is, and for um, and and for religion in general. I think there was a very big respect there in Breen's writing, and it comes through when Breen uh, and Webb uh, uh, get together on something that he he's got this respect, and it, uh, and it comes across in the in the portrayal, and it gives us something more to Novak than just somebody who uh, does jobs for money and you know will do anything for money. Uh, from the first few episodes, you might have imagined that Pat Novak would have ended up on a dangerous reality TV show today. Um, like, eat bugs? Well, you got a chance to win a million dollars. Okay. Uh, but you got a, a picture that there's maybe a little bit more. Sadly, I don't think we ever get to uh, the core of the man in the show, but... Uh, it's lots of fun to have these glimpses that suggest that Novak may not be the uh, the type of hard-edged, uh, immor totally immoral per person that sometimes the the episodes might suggest, and sometimes, of course, Jocko Madigan not, might suggest. All right. Well, and, and by the way, uh, some great quotes this episode. I find if I try and read them on the air, um, I did that a little bit when I was doing the. Um, uh, consecutive all the way through um, uh, Pat Novak. I, I, I said, you know, that sounds really flat. So I included some of my favorite quotes uh, from a, from this week's episode, and I, I do that with every week's episode, over at uh, greatdetectives.net. So uh, some fun uh, reading to remember the show by. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you another exciting episode of Let George Do It. Uh, with Bob Bailey. As we get started, I want to, as always, uh, encourage you, got any comments, feel free to email me. Send it over to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Also, uh, please go and uh, cast your vote for us at Podcast Alley. Very simple uh, redirect. Uh, Podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Uh, and, uh, as always, our, uh, we definitely want to know who's uh, listening, uh, so fill out our short survey over at survey.greatdetectives.net. Um, one thing I, I wanted to mention is Let George Do It actually aired up in Canada uh, to Harry Goodman Radio Productions. Uh, they made, um, or they syndicated 52 of those episodes. Uh, now, company has actually found uh, found 40 of those episodes, um, and including about half which aren't in circulation in the United States. Now, you can't tell actually like where they go in the uh, American uh, uh, stream of episodes; those that went out over the uh, mutual broadcasting system. You, you just you just can't tell. Uh, because uh, the dates all vary. Uh, this was kind of like a best of Let George Do It uh, airing up in Canada. Uh, they're not in general circulation, so they are actually available at the site radioarchives.com. That's archives with an S dot com. And it's the volume one and volume two of their Let George Do It. They've got a volume three. Um, but those are epi those are actually episodes that have already been in circulation in the U.S. And you gotta wonder because I know that some of these shows were actually played internationally, and I'm wondering if there are you know additional uh, old time radio disc and archives in some of these foreign countries that just have simply not been uh, uh, discovered. Uh, Definitely will be interesting if you happen to be in, uh, be sitting on any of these um, archive discs, uh, get them to a qualified archivist. Um, encourage you to do that. Uh, many of the media these were originally put on, like reel to reel tapes, uh, they degrade over time. So, over time, uh, some of these shows could end up being lost uh, forever. So, get them to a qualified archivist. Um, 
uh, email, email me um, if you you've got ones that, uh, and I will I will try to figure figure out. Uh, Box thirteen at greatdetectives.net. Uh, public service announcement: I know a guy or two I can ask for uh, suggestions and uh, figure anything out. Um, all right. Uh, well, one thing I want to encourage you to do uh, is the importance of uh, good hosting. Uh, we we feel comfortable doing this show, unlike previous shows, doing this on our own host because of the quality of the hosting company we have that host our website and host the files. Uh, we have unlimited downloading. That means we don't have to worry about the show getting uh, too popular and uh, being told by our host, sorry, you've had too many downloads. You've taken up too much bandwidth. Not a concern with our host one-on-one. Also, uh, th this site uh, comes with the benefit of generous storage limits. Uh, so we can continue to upload episodes after episodes without having any reasonable fear of uh, running out any t of space anytime soon. Uh, plus affordable pricing uh, that we can rely on. Uh, this is the stuff. This is the type of service we found at one on one and 24/7 tech support. And I encourage you to give it a try. Uh, if you'd like to try one-on-one -on -one and learn about their services for individuals, small business, big business, uh, as well as domains, then just simply go to hosting.greatdetectives.net, hosting.greatdetectives.net, and try one-on-one. -on -one. Well, let's go ahead and get into today's episode, The Penthouse Roof. Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If the trouble you're in is way off the beaten track and you need help that's strictly confidential, you've got a job for me. George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Dear sir, you employed the word confidential in your advertisement. Uh, well, I need confidential help. My enthusiasm for birds has led me into a predicament. I was watching starlings, but I saw something that was never meant to be seen, and it keeps haunting me, if I really saw it. Unless my eyes deceive me... me, I was the witness, the only witness, to an outrageous crime. There's nothing more I can say in a letter. Please contact me at once, and it's signed Elliot Wormsley. <laughs> Wormsley? That sounds like a name on a Dickens. Elliot Wormsley, MS, PhD, Statistical Services, Baxter Building. Bird watcher, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of canaries is this statistician interested in anyway? Oh, stop kidding, George. That's a pretty grim phrase. I was the only witness to an outrageous crime. Yeah, and he's in a predicament. That's a twist. What was it he could have seen? I don't know, Brooksy, but let's see what we can see. Let's drop in on Dr. Wormsley. <laughs> These are the binoculars, Mr. Valentine. They're the ones I use to watch starlings on that penthouse roof down there. Uh -huh. But that's almost three blocks away, Dr. Wormsley. Yeah, I know. The river house, huh? Pretty swanky. Golly, George. You can see halfway around the world with these binoculars. All right, Angel. Stop playing. Uh, back to you, Dr. Wormsley. So you looked for starlings and saw a killer hawk. Uh, something like that, Mr. Valentine. Okay. Now, just what was this outrageous crime? What did you see that you shouldn't have seen? Uh, Murder. Oh, I guess I dropped your binoculars, Doctor. Did you say murder? Uh, I, I can't be sure, uh, but I just trained my eyes down there, as I've been doing for weeks. And in that instant, I'm almost certain I saw a man push another man off the roof. Uh, of course, he had his back to me. What do you mean, almost certain, Dr. Wormsley? Well, it, it, it was over in a second, and I, I didn't expect to see what I think I saw. Besides, uh, statistics show that the element of error in visualization over a hundred yards is 14 to a thousand. Yeah, well, we'll take your word for that. But why didn't you go to the police with this story? Oh, no, no, Mr. Valentine. I'm a modest man, and I don't like publicity. Besides, I'm coming up for the presidency of my club. 
And, uh, well, so many people think bird-watching is, uh, well, uh, a little peculiar. Yes, I know. You wouldn't make it. But murder is a very serious business. Uh, Mr. Valentine, if I had seen any mention of what I suspected in the newspapers, I would have volunteered this information to the police. But as it is, no crime has been reported. Well, that's right, George. I didn't see anything about it. Still, the picture of those two men keeps haunting me. I'm thinking of my reputation, but I, I do have some public spirit, and I have to make sure. My conscience wouldn't let me rest if I didn't. Oh, I see. And you want me to check at the River House and soothe your conscience. That's it, young man, precisely. It uh, shouldn't take you more than a day, and I'm uh, willing to pay your usual fee. <laughs> okay, it's a deal, Wormsley. Oh, Brooksy. Yes, George. Just on a hunch, get out of the Bureau of Missing Persons. See Finley. Okay. Find out if anybody's been reported missing from the River House. You will keep my name out of this, won't you? Oh, yes, we'll do our best, Professor. I'll meet you back here later, Brooksy. Okay, George. I'm going over to the River House. <laughs> Oh, you're very fortunate, Mr. Valentine. Penthouse B is vacant, and it's only $5,400 a year. Yeah, a point of information, Mr. Stevens. As I get it, the uh, sun deck of this wing facing the river is for the exclusive use of Penthouse A and B. Oh, it's very private. And Penthouse A is occupied by the Dunlaps, Philip Dunlap, the broker. So that would put you in very good company, and only $5,400 a year. Well, I was thinking of something a little better, but uh, I'll let you know. went and rang my doorbell. Wouldn't be the fuller brush man, would you? <laughs> Not unless my samples are showing. <laughs> oh, come on in anyway. I hope you'll pardon the sunsuit. I wasn't expecting company. Oh, no, it's nothing at all. I mean, practically. I was out on the roof sunbathing. Uh, and Mrs. Dunlap? That's right. Well, I'm the chapel. It's been a dull afternoon. Suppose we wait a while before you tell me what you want. Hmm? Well, as a matter of fact... You aren't going to stand there, are you? Here, sit down. <clears throat> Uh, the truth is, Mrs. Dunlap, I may be your next-door neighbor in Penthouse B. Oh? Well, that would be the first improvement they've made in River House without raising our rent. Uh, I thought it'd be a nice gesture to sort of drop in on my possible neighbors and introduce myself. Hmm. There is a Mr. Dunlap, isn't there? Uh, yes, but you needn't worry about him. He hasn't been home for two days. Oh, just like that, huh? Well, that's Philip for you. Thank heavens. He must have decided to go up to our cabin in the mountains to brood. Or he may be staying at his club. Mm. But as I said, this looked like a dull afternoon. We're not going to let it be one, are we? Ah. Uh, oh, fine. That wouldn't be Philip. He has his key. Well, whoever it is, just explain I'm looking at the penthouse next door. Hal. Listen, Paula, we haven't heard from Philip yet, and there are letters and contracts he has to sign downtown. All right, Hal. I'm not my husband's keeper. Oh, just the same. I thought you might be worried. Oh. Oh, I didn't know you were having company. Well, this gentleman may be our next-door neighbor, I hope. Uh, Mr. The Re name's Valentine. Oh. Really, Paula? At least now you know his name. Oh, Mr. Valentine, this intense young man is my husband's secretary, Hal Sterrett. How do you do? Oh. I don't know what you're going to do, Paula, but I'm going to call the police and report Philip Missing. Uh, please do that, Hal. I'd feel so much better. Lord, how I hate righteous men, especially when they're young. So petulant. Oh, where were we, Mr. Valentine? Uh, I was just about to leave. Uh, a mood is a very fragile thing, isn't it? <laughs> oh, you've been right neighborly, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. I don't think it's goodbye. Anyway, it was very nice even not having known you. <laughs> Mr. Valentine. Mr. Valentine. Hmm? Oh, Dr. Wormsley. I, I was waiting for you to come out of the River House. But why? I thought you made it a point you were to be the unknown factor in this deal. Uh, well, uh, after you left, I, I did some calculating. Yeah, good for you, good for you. 
There must be a way of getting into this empty lot without climbing over that fence. And in my calculations, I discovered that the odds against anything as extraordinary as this happening to an ordinary man like me would be about uh, uh, 14,000 to one. Mm, you don't say. Uh, so if you don't mind, Mr. Valentine, I'd, I'd sort of like to uh, tag along with you and see if I'm uh, really that one in 14,000. Uh-huh. Looks as though there's a gate in this fence. If we can get these fish cans out of the way. Oh, George! George! Hey, Brooksy, you should have brought a friend. We'd have a fourth for bridge. Oh, oh hello, Miss Brooks. Oh, George, there's been no report of anyone missing in this district. Oh, thanks. I was on my way to your office, Dr. Wormsley, when I saw you heading for the river house. So here I am. Well, kids, let's see what we shall see. Just an overgrown lot. Uh, that's right. George, you think that if Dr. Wormsley is right, the man would Nothing be... like checking, Brooksy. Dr. S- Dr. Wormsley, you did say that when you saw a man pushing another one off the roof, his back was towards you? If I saw what I thought I saw. That's right. Uh-huh. That would mean he was facing away from you, toward the river. Uh, yes, yes. Well, there's the river behind that highboard fence. And on this side of the building, there are only the windows and the elevator shafts and the stairway. So no one would have seen him fall. Mr. Valentine, oh, over here, over here, look. Huh? That, that's a man. I, I mean, it was. Huh? huh? Past tense is putting it my way. Oh, George. Then it, it, it wasn't my imagination after all. No. No, Dr. Wormsley, it wasn't. And just to quote a few more odds, it's at least a million to one this is the body of Philip Dunlap. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Ballantyne in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about the great American pastime. If you're a baseball fan, check these two tips for getting the most out of this season. Number one, when you're driving to and from the game, use fast-starting Chevron Supreme gasoline. Special blending agents in Chevron Supreme give your car speedy warm-up and quick pickup for traffic getaways. And when it comes to hill climbing, premium quality Chevron Supreme gasoline takes you smoothly over the steepest ones. Number two, at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where you can get Chevron Supreme gasoline, there's a grand gift for you. It's a 48-page book about baseball written by Bert Dunn. You'll find in your free copy of Batter Up the fundamentals about this great American sport. One illustrated section shows how to play each different position. Ask for a free copy of Batter Up tomorrow. It's yours at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. It's only natural for a member of the Bird Watcher Society, even when he's a professional statistician like Dr. Wormsley, to be watching starlings on a penthouse roof. But when instead his binoculars reveal one man pushing another off that self-same roof, well, that's just sort of a case George would get involved in. It's about an hour since George found Philip Dunlap's body in the weed-covered lot back of the apartment building. And now we join George and Claire talking to Lieutenant Riley at Homicide. Yeah, what is it? Uh, Lieutenant Riley, Donnelly just brought Hal Starrett in. Do you want to see him now? No. Let him cool his heels out there a while with Mrs. Dunlap. Yes, sir. Now, about Dr. Wormsley, Lieutenant Riley. Okay, Valentine, okay. When Lieutenant Johnson turned the case over to me, I didn't know what I was getting in for, but I'll do my best to keep your client's name out of the case. Ah, you're a pal. Well, as a matter of fact, Lieutenant, you owe our little bird watcher a debt. He did uncover a murder. Miss Brooks... I don't want to appear ungrateful. Oh, no. I can always use a new murder. Oh? I'm overjoyed that when you and Valentine stumbled over this homicide, you were uh, thoughtful enough to let me know about it. Oh, well, it's nothing at all. If you hadn't, I'd lock both of you up and throw the key away. Well, now that you've had your own sweet self, would you mind telling us what you found out from Mrs. Dunlap? Uh... Well, she said she was out shopping all that afternoon, and the doorman is alibying her. When she got back, this kid, uh, Starrett, was still there, waiting to see his boss, Mr. Dunlap. He hung around a little longer and then beat him. Uh-huh. Did uh, Mrs. Dunlap suggest that there might have been any bad blood between Starrett and her husband? 
Well, she wasn't too anxious to admit it, but it seems young Starrett was being fired. Yeah, but what was the reason? Bad spelling or making Google eyes at the boss's wife? I wouldn't know. Not yet. Mrs. Dunlap was too broken up to go into every little detail. <laughs> broken up, huh? I can just see her tears flowing like wine. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, just thinking out loud. Uh, yes, Lieutenant? You can send Starrett in here now. Yes, sir. Well, it looks to me as though Mr. Starrett has some explaining to do, or else. Well, we know that he was there that afternoon, and your Dr. Wormsley saw a man push Dunlap off the roof. Uh, come in, son. Come in, come in. Lieutenant, Sit I don't out. understand any of this. I. Oh, you. Hello, Starrett. What are you doing here? Just a neighborly interest in the fate of your late employer. Say, what is this? Yes, George, I didn't know you two had met. Well, never mind. Now, what's this about Dunlap deciding to fire you, Starrett? Well, I, uh... Why? He, uh... He didn't like my work, I guess. That's the usual reason, isn't it? You'll save a lot of time if you tell us the truth. You asked me a question, and I gave you the only answer you're going to get. You had a fight with your boss, didn't you? No. In the struggle, you pushed him off the roof. No. A man saw you from an office building. He couldn't have. Oh, Lieutenant. Yes, Donnelly. Can I see you a minute? Yeah, okay. I'll be right back. Hey, tell me something, Starrett. Yes? If you were already fired, why were you so worried about Dunlap? Even going to the Bureau of Missing Persons yourself. Because he was the best friend I ever had. It hardly jives with the story Lieutenant Riley is building up. Hey, Starrett. Yes? You're a college man, aren't you? Oh, what of it? Syracuse, 1942. What? Why, yes, but, but how did you know? This, um, Phi, uh, Phi Beta Kappa, too, aren't you? That's right. But what are you driving at, Lieutenant? Well, uh... This Phi Beta Kappa key. The medical examiner found it clenched in Dunlap's fist. It's yours. I... I don't know how it could have gotten there. He must have ripped the key off your chain as he fell off the roof. Okay, Starrett, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. It's nice of you to visit me in jail, Valentine. But what's the use of going over the same story again? Well, Paula would go right... Let's say it intrigues me, sir. Paula would go right on denying I ever gave her that key. I can't prove it. Why should you believe me any more than anyone else? Because I happen to know a little more about the lady in question. Now, look, friend, let's stop being delicate. Paula decided she liked your type and made you the odd man in the triangle. That's why Dunlap was giving you the gate. Oh, I... I tried to break off with her. But she always managed to be around, taunting me. She had me spinning on my head. Yeah, I know what you mean. Say, did you have a fight with Dunlap when he fired you? No, I... I wish there had been. That would have been easier than the way it was. Go on. He was hurt. And I was sick and ashamed of myself. He knew there were others, and that made the whole thing even cheaper. Now, surely just firing you, Starrett, wasn't the answer for Dunlap. Oh, he knew that. One of my last acts as his secretary was drawing up the papers that cut her out of his will. Hey, now, wait a minute. That just puts you in deeper. That means Paula had no motive. Hey, how about insurance? Well, uh, there was a big policy Philip took out recently with Paula's beneficiary. He didn't change that. Oh, isn't that kind of strange? Oh, it wasn't something he overlooked. There was a funny smile on his face when he told me he was leaving that as is. That's very interesting. Oh, look, Valentine, I didn't kill Philip. When I was there, I didn't even know he was out on the roof. Oh, okay, I'll just take it easy. I'll do what I can. What can you do? You'll never get the truth about that key out of Paula. And Dr. Wors or Wormsley swears there was a man out there struggling with Philip. What man? A burglar? One of Paula's ex-boyfriends? Or possibly the man on the moon? I think I'll drop in on Paula again. I don't know what I expect to find, but with a gal like that, the unexpected is bound to be interesting. <laughs> It isn't my next-door neighbor. What now? Cup of sugar? Couple of eggs? Well, maybe I did make a little fib, but you didn't believe me anyway, did you, Mrs. Dunlap? Paula. Okay, Paula. Too bad about young Starrett, isn't it? What a thing to say to a grief-stricken widow. Can I get you anything? We may as well make ourselves comfortable. <laughs> You've got a head start in those lounging pajamas. They're really something. <laughs> I was wondering when you were going to notice them. Hey, you know... I never appreciated before what lounging pajamas can do for a woman. Didn't you? No, no. I might say if she were 
out on a roof, and someone happened to see her from Dr. Wormsley's window, he might mistake her for a man. Hmm, if he'd never seen a woman before. His office is more than two blocks away. But uh, to get back to our hypothetical woman, yes. how much do you guess she'd have coming to her if her husband were murdered and there was a nice fat insurance policy, the only thing he didn't cut her out of? We've gotten a long way from lounging pajamas. Oh, I don't know. And I can't help wondering what the lady in question would do if she had a perfect patsy and a difficult young man who was suffering pangs of conscience. She might even do something brash if she happened to remember the Phi Beta Kappa key he gave her in a tender moment. Tell me, have you confided these flights of fancy to anyone else? Oh, no, my sweet. I wanted you to be the first to know. And you, my sweet, will ruin your eyes reading all those pulp magazines. There's another angle to this lady of the rooftop. Oh, what's that? Hmm, with all the insurance money she's sure to get, and with an admiring eye for a certain broad-shouldered character who seems to know what it's all about... Oh, she might make life very pleasant for him. Very. Hmm. Uh, you couldn't say he knew what it was all about if he fell for a pitch like that now, could you? Oh. I'd better get my cigarette before we go on with this little game. Or you can quit playing any time you want to. My dear old father used to play a lot of poker. He used to say the game was never over till the last bluff was called. Uh-huh. Didn't your old man tell you that even one of those effeminate-looking automatics make a loud noise and leave holes when they go off? I have a permit for this gun. Uh-oh. Come on now, Paula. Let's see if you can answer that phone with one hand. You know, Georgie, that could be your next to the last glib remark. When that phone stops ringing, you're going to worry yourself into a tizzy, trying to guess who it was. We've been supposing a lot of things here tonight. Now, let me top it off. Suppose they found you draped on the floor there with a bullet in your head. Okay, what then? I was in bed when I heard sounds in the living room. I opened the door. There was a figure in the darkness. After everything I'd been through, I didn't stop to think. I shot the prowler. I gotta hand it to you, Paula. Skip it. Just sit there on the couch a few minutes till I get my story straight. When I shoot you, I may have to tell the story a dozen times tonight, so it's got to be perfect. <laughs> Okay, you stalled too long. You missed a chance, beautiful. It'd be a mistake to shoot me now. What are you talking about? Behind you, there's somebody out there on the penthouse roof. How you know I'm smarter than that? Well, who's the... I'll take the toy now. Oh, you Drop it. Go, is that you? Oh, Josh, there you are. I tried to call, and then I remembered about the empty penthouse next door and the adjoining sun deck, and... Oh, for Pete's sake, somebody say something. Oh, just a little parlor game, Brooksy. Uh, yes, yes, I... I was just showing Mr. Valentine how I almost mistook him for an intruder. Oh. Uh, Lieutenant Raleigh will probably find it very amusing when we tell him about it. Oh. <laughs> that ain't the way I see it. For the time being, Angel, we have to see things Paula's way. But more important right now is to see if we can get a man out of bed. <laughs> No trouble at all, Valentine. Don't mind selling a little insurance any time of the night. Are these all representative policies, Bennett? Yes, sir. Anything you want, we've got it. Life, accident, comprehensive liability, tornado insurance, plate glass. Any insurance against fatality during parlor games? Uh, what's that, Miss Brooks? Uh, just a private show. This life insurance policy. Oh, any amount you want. Just a simple physical Well, these family. clauses at the beginning, they are pretty standard in all life insurance policies, aren't oh, they? Yes, indeed. Each one of them meant to protect policyholder and the company. Huh? What's up, George? Well, uh, thanks a lot, Bennett. You've been a great help. Yeah, but look, old man. Sorry, I'm shopping awesome. around, but I'll keep you in mind. Let's go, Brooksy. Well, Brooksy, first thing in the morning, I want you to check with all the druggists in this section of town around River House, Dr. Wormsley's office, 20 or 30 blocks in each direction. Oh. My aching I'm going to be with Lieutenant Riley. I hate to think of his blood pressure when I mention one little word. Order, please. That's the word. Darling, sign, if I had any hair, I'd tear it out. What are you talking about? Well, now, look, it can't do any harm, Lieutenant. No one in his right mind can doubt how Dunlap died. This Wormsley saw him shoved off the roof. Then the body was found sprawled all over an empty lot, 12 floors below. Cause and effect. I have every reason to doubt that Sterrett killed Dunlap. Ah, uh, I suppose you're going to tell me Mrs. Dunlap killed him, huh? That she used to be the strong woman in the circus. I didn't say she killed him. Then who... What? Ah, for the love of heaven. How about that autopsy, Lieutenant? 
All right, Doctor. Will you tell Valentine here that he's just been wasting our time? I wouldn't say that, Lieutenant. Huh? What you find? Enough poison in Dunlap to stop an army dead in its tracks. All right. All right, I can't argue with the laboratory. But I don't get it, Valentine. How many times do you kill a man? Poison, throw him off the roof. Ah, it's a wonder we didn't find a knife at his back, too. Doctor, just how does this particular poison work? Instantly. Every muscle in the body becomes rigid all at once and stays that way. Uh-huh. Then it's possible that after a couple of days, the effects of the poison could be mistaken for rigor mortis. Not only possible, Mr. Valtan. It seems just what happened. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If Dunlap's fist was clenched like that the moment the poison took effect, how did that five beta copper key get in his hand? That's the point, Lieutenant. It was forced into it. And certainly Hal Sterrett didn't do it. That does it. That does it. I'm going to have Paula Dunlap picked up, and she'd better have all the answers. Oh, no. No, Mrs. Dunlap, you're going to have to do better than that. I know how it looks, Lieutenant Raleigh, but you're wrong. Believe me. Paula, you had to be the one who put that key in your husband's hand. Sterrett wouldn't sign his own death warrant. I know, but Here are the facts the jury will hear. You were the man Wormsley saw wearing lounging pajamas. You had the motive, the insurance money, so you poisoned Mr. Dunlap, then pushed him off the roof to implicate an innocent man. All right. All right. I'll tell you just what happened. Remember, Mrs. Dunlap, you're doing this of your own free will. Hal Sterrett left that afternoon. I went out on the roof for a moment. Philip was there, an empty highball glass next to him. He was dead. Oh, don't look at me that way. He was already dead. He'd committed suicide. How do you know that? There was a note. Cruel note. Saying that I was the cause of all the unhappiness in his life. He was leaving me without a cent. Okay. I suppose you have the note. No. No, I destroyed it. Oh, no, that wasn't very smart. Don't you see? I had to. So no one would ever find out it was suicide. Now, wait a minute. There was a clause in his policy. It's in most policies. Saying that if he killed himself within the first year... The beneficiary wouldn't get a cent. That much is true, Lieutenant. What I did was wrong, but I wasn't going to let Philip leave me without a cent. That'll stand up in court, won't it? Even though I did destroy the note, they'll believe me, won't they? Since you ask my opinion, the answer's no. But my job is finished now. Oh, no, no. George. I... George. Hey, how goes it, Brooksy? What luck? You were right. I found out what you wanted to know at the Gotham Pharmacy on Morton Boulevard. Now what? What am I going to do? I've got to find a way to prove I'm innocent. This isn't fair. Remembering that gun you held in my face and Hal Starrett, I'm tempted to keep my mouth shut and let you stew in your own juice. What do you mean? Me and you both. I don't know what charge you're going to hold her on, Lieutenant. But it won't be murder. What? Did you hear what he said, Lieutenant? What are you talking about, Valentine? Looks he just found out that Philip Dunlap bought that poison himself at the Gotham Pharmacy. On a doctor's prescription he forged. Oh, George... Oh, how can I ever thank you? Oh, that's easy. The next time you're up on that roof alone, see if you can prove the law of gravity really works. George, don't you think that was sort of a morbid joke for Dunlap to play on his wife? Well, Angel, Paula played a few pretty grim jokes herself. Yes, but to leave her name in that insurance policy, knowing that she wouldn't get a penny. Crime, punishment, so much. Oh, uh, hello. Anybody here? Oh, oh Dr. Burns. I just thought I'd drop in and take care of that little bill I owe you. Oh, thanks. Um, how do the birds look these days, Doctor? Uh, what? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that reminds me. I must thank you, Valentine, for keeping my name out of the Dunlap case. After all, I was the key witness, and I... Uh, Oh, dear. Well, that's all washed up now. Uh, thank goodness. Oh, yes. Hmm? Uh, Mrs. Dunlap isn't living there anymore, you know. Huh? It seems three young ladies are sharing that apartment now. And yesterday... Why, Dr. Wormsley, oh. what kind of birds are you watching now? Oh, well, uh, they, uh, they were very wild canaries. Oh, goodness, <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> Next 
next week when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Well, Brooksy looks like playing Big Brother a la Spencer Tracy didn't work out. Eddie beat it while I was shaving. Oh, that crazy little kid. Yeah, he left this note. He's on the prowl. To quote, he's going after Stan Lucas. Oh, no. What can we do, George? i got to stop him somehow. Hey, listen. You look up Emily. Maybe she can give us a clue on how we can find Eddie. Okay, George. And remember, Brooksy, it's a race against time. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George, with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appeared as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little, Jr., and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louise Arthur, Fred Howard, Peter Leeds, Charles Seal, and Charles Lund. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Don't forget to listen again next week, one hour earlier, over the same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Um, You know, I don't think that professor guy was watching birds uh, at any time. Uh, but I guess we get the context uh, towards the end. I was kind of going through this. Oh, he's watching birds. Why is that a big deal? He wants to keep out of press. Oh, because he wasn't. <clears throat> um, I, I, um, I think, again, you saw George Allentine being a stand-up, stand-up guy. He could have just let uh, the wife take the heat uh, for the whole crime. And certainly she deserves some uh, punishment because she was uh, basically covering up some uh, some evidence that could have sent an innocent man away. She was cold, but she wasn't a murderer. So you have to appreciate that general integrity that uh, really drives uh, that really drives uh, George Valentine. I think that's what part of what makes the show work so well. The other thing now. Um, uh, over on the Dragnet Show, we've had many uh, discussions by email about to include or not to include uh, commercials. And the point's been made to me several times that commercials really give, can give you a look back into the times. I didn't feel that way about the Fatima commercials, but I found that baseball commercial uh, during the uh, intermission between the first and second half of the show, I found that pretty... Uh, uh, actually, pr- pretty good and a nice, nice contrast uh, to our times. You generally don't see these big contests around baseball because, uh, for better or for worse, it's been uh, eclipsed by football, certainly, and perhaps even to an extent basketball uh, in the national consciousness. So that was a nice flashback. Um, and I guess uh, it's like I, I wish baseball were as big as it. Uh, as it used to be, um, I think I, I was one. Of, I was. I, I'm either been born before my time or after it. I guess only time will tell. And we are now going to begin to listen to uh, perhaps the most well-known homes, and in many ways the most controversial. Over the years, there have been a lot of attempts to remake Sherlock Holmes. And in many ways, uh, the production team will explain how they're going to do it differently than Basil Rathbone, and with not perhaps, in many ways, the kindest words for Rathbone's uh, portrayal of Holmes, and in particular, uh, Nigel Bruce's portrayal of Dr. Watson. Uh, It's been quite quite a few years, and Basil Rathbone, uh, basically at this point, remains the Babe Ruth of Sherlock Holmes portrayal. I don't think anybody um, in the world consciousness, um, despite the different remakes, um, while while many have been entertaining and interesting, I don't think any have come close, uh, at least in the American mindset, uh, to Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes. Now, there was 
Uh, some BBC films, I've not seen them from, for myself, starring Jeremy Brett. And perhaps, I don't know, in, in Britain it may be different. But I, I think in America, um, Basil Rathbone um, would probably be the most recognizable actor as uh, Sherlock Holmes. In this teaming we, we've got, starting with this episode uh, from the 1939 series, um, you've got Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, um, who, after doing uh, two movies uh, for 20th Century Fox, and in, uh, began this radio series that would actually continue while they made another 12 uh, Sherlock Holmes films. Now, many of these films were, were much shorter um, than normal feature-length uh, motion pictures uh, that uh, generally come in about 90 minutes. Many of these are about an hour, so pretty, uh, pretty quick entertainment. Some you know, go up to about 74 minutes in this whole Universal collection, and some kind of verge on being B-movies. Uh, but they're widely available still. Uh, many, uh, particularly the last film, Dress to Kill, have gone into the public domain, uh, allowing a wide, uh, a wide viewership. And in fact, uh, again, those dollar DVD bins you'll see at Target and Walmart uh, will invariably have uh, some Sherlock Holmes movies in them, and there'll be uh, and several of them with Basil Rathbone. A Rathbone uh, is, is actually a, a pretty interesting, uh, a, a pretty pretty interesting character himself. Um, one thing I, I think as we listen to the show that ma is, makes his Holmes portrayal different um, is that Rathbone and Bruce were both uh, British. Uh, a lot of the actors to play Holmes were. Amer you know, Americans playing uh, 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 playing with British accents. Um, Rathbone was British, born in South Africa. And one th thing that really made him such a great Holmes for this era is, I is he really was um, a British patriot. Unlike some British actors in Hollywood, he never renounced his citizenship. Uh, and, and the thing that makes the Rathbone portrayal so interesting to me is that he was a real-life um, hero. You know, most of the action heroes we see both today and then, they're action stars uh, in the sense that they p uh, played one on TV in the movies. Basil Rathbone, he was the real deal. He served in the military during World War I, and uh, uh, he went up to his commanding officer uh, and... This is actually a quote from an interview. He said, I went to my commanding officer and I said that I thought we'd get a great deal more information from the enemy if we didn't fool around in the dark so much. And I asked him whether I could go out in daylight. In daylight. I think he thought we were a little crazy. I said we'd go out camouflaged, made up as trees with branches sticking out of our heads and arms. We brought back an awful lot of information and a few prisoners too. Uh, in fact... For his service, Rathbone actually received the Military Cross. Uh, and I've got the um, supplemental from the London Gazette with that uh, citation in there. For conspicuous daring and resource on patrol. On one occasion, while inside the hostile wire, he came face to face with one of the enemy, whom he at once shot. This raised the alarm, and an intense fire was opened, but he crept through the entanglement with his three men and got safely back. The result of his patrolling was a thorough knowledge of the locality and strength of all enemy posts in the vicinity. So you've got a real-life uh, hero playing the uh, uh, hero on the radio. Somebody who, uh, from real-life experience, probably had more in common uh, with Sherlock Holmes than anyone else to play the part. Uh, then we got Nigel Bruce as um, uh, playing Dr. Watson. And from the movies, this was kind of a uh, something that's been controversial because uh, Watson often got played for some uh, light comic relief. And people just, uh, a lot of people just think, totally inappropriate. Rathbone de defended the portrayal because Bruce was his friend. 
Uh, but a lot of people have, you know, really sold this. Hey, we're redefining uh, Dr. Watson as not just some bumbling sidekick. Uh, but what do people think of Dr. Watson? They think of a bumbling sidekick. Has not worked. For better or worse, Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce still um, remain the most uh, most influential pair in this whole world of Sherlock Holmes. They did more than 200 episodes. Unfortunately, most of those are not uh, in existence. Um, during the war years, um, the transcription CD uh, disc, uh, where, where, uh, meant, where the, most of these shows, uh, if there were records made, were much more likely than in the post-war or pre-war years to end up and uh, end up destroyed, because basically there was metal in these discs, and they could um, they could be uh, melted down um, for metal. So a lot of radio shows got lost in the process of defeating uh, defeating Nazi Germany. Well, I, I love old-time radio. I'm definite, I'll definitely take defeating the Nazis first. But a slight detriment there. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get into today's show. This one is based on a short story from the collection His Final Bow. It's called The Bruce Partington Plans, which, given that uh, Britain had already entered World War II, the, the subtext of the plot, even though... Um, like the actual home stories and not the movies, this was set in uh, Victorian times. Um, I think the actual subtext of the, of the times that this was being aired back in 1939 really um, uh, really made this a timely story. So let's go ahead and take a listen uh, to The Bruce Partington Plan. The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. The makers of Grove's Bromo Quinine Tablets bring you another adventure of Sherlock Holmes with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. A cold is a miserable thing. A cold may become a dangerous thing. Even a so-called light cold can take a serious turn. Be prompt, be decisive in your treatment of a cold. At the very first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets quickly check the symptoms of a cold, quickly relieve the distress of a cold. They give you speedy results which are very important. Don't monkey around when you can get such a dependable preparation as Grove's bromoquinine tablets. And now, here we are again on our usual visit to Dr. Watson. He's waiting for us in his study, a cheerful blaze crackling on the hearth. Very relieved to see you, Mr. Manning. Hasn't the weather been atrocious today? I was beginning to wonder if you'd be able to get here tonight through all this fog. Yes, it certainly is what you Londoners call a regular pea super. <laughs> yes, indeed. It reminds me of the adventure of the missing submarine plans, a case that was solved in the underground. Underground? What you Americans call a, a subway. Yes, but what has a solution in a subway got to do with a foggy night? Well, you see, the affair started in weather exactly like this. It was the third week in November, the year 1895, to be exact. On Monday, a dense yellow fog had settled down upon London. On Thursday, it was still there, thicker and, and murkier than ever. At first, Holmes had turned his nervous energy to cross-indexing his huge reference books. But when, after pushing our breakfast chairs back for the, for the fourth morning, we saw the greasy brown swirl still drifting past the windows, Holmes's patience snapped. Holmes, if you must pace around in circles, I wish you'd change directions now and then. You're, you're making me dizzy. Bah! It's inexcusable, Watson. Inexcusable. No initiative. No imagination. Nothing ever gets done. If you're alluding to the inactivity in this last session of Parliament, my dear Holmes... I'm not speaking of our lawmakers, Watson, but of our lawbreakers. The London criminal is certainly a dull fellow. What makes you say that? Well, look out of the window. 
Ideal weather for committing a crime. The criminal advances and his intended victim practically unseen. He pounces and disappears into thin air. <laughs> there have been numerous petty thefts, ah, I believe. Petty, petty thefts, pickpockets, ragamuffins. What's the country coming to? Now, if I were a criminal, Watson... Well, I, for one, would move to America. <laughs> oh, hello, hello. Mrs. Hudson is knocking excited. What's up, I wonder? Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? Oh, a telegram for me. Oh, yes, sir. Very well, thank you. Oh, well, what's it say? Oh, wait until I open it, can't you? Ah, dear me, what next? Most unusual, Watson, most unusual. What's most unusual, Watson? What's it say? Oh, well, it's from my brother, Mycroft. You remember him. He helped us solve the case of the Greek interpreter. He's coming here. Why not? What's so phenomenal about it? Why that? not? Why not, indeed? It's as startling as it would be to meet a tram car coming down a country lane. Yes, yes, now I come to think of it. Uh, Mycroft is rather like a tram car. His rails lead from his Pall Mall lodgings to the Diogenes Club in Whitehall. That's his circle. I wonder what upheaval could have derailed him. Doesn't the telegram explain? It says, uh, must see you about Cadogan West coming at once. Cadogan West? Doug and where? Why, that's the young chap was found dead in the underground on Tuesday morning. I remember reading about it in the papers. Oh? The young man had apparently fallen out of a train and, and killed himself. He hadn't been robbed, and there was no reason to suspect violence. Quite an uninteresting case, if I remember correctly. And yet, it's serious enough to cause Mycroft to alter his habits. No, Watson, this must be an extraordinary event. Uh, do you recall any other facts about the affair? Yes, now I come to think of it, there was one unusual bit about who came out of the inquest. They were unable to ascertain at what point he entered the train, because his ticket was missing. Strange. What articles were found on the body? Oh, two pounds fifteen, I believe it was, a checkbook and... Oh, yes, 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 two dress circle tickets for the Woolwich Theatre, dated for that evening. Theatre tickets, eh? Then it wasn't suicide. A man doesn't procure theatre tickets for the evening on which he intends to end his life. Anything else? A small packet of... Technical papers. Technical papers? What kind of technical papers? The, new, the newspapers didn't say. Ah, as serious as that. What did the young man do? Where was he employed? He was a clerk at Woolwich Arsenal. Ah, government employee. There we have it, Watson. British government, Woolwich Arsenal, technical papers. That's why Mycroft is involved in this affair. I don't understand. No, I suppose not. Watson, have I ever told you what Mycroft is? Your brother, of course. Oh, no, 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 Watson. Do you have to be so dense? I mean, do you know what he does? Hmm? I seem to have some vague recollection that you once told me that he'd held some small office under the British government. It would be more accurate to say, in a way, that he is the British government. What? His position is unique. He made it for himself. As the tidiest and most orderly brain of any man alive, with a great capacity for storing facts and giving them the proper interpretation. The conclusions of every government department are passed on to him. He's the central exchange, the clearing house. Again and again, his word has decided the national policy. He thinks of nothing else. Nothing else can lure him from his contemplations. And yet he's coming here. Yes, Jupiter is descending on us today. What on earth can it happen? Uh, now, Watson, that sounds suspiciously like a bad pun. Ah, here he is, if I'm not mistaken, to speak for himself. Come in, come in. Hello, Mycroft. What's up? What's up? You look flustered. Most annoying business, Sherlock. Most annoying. You know how I dislike altering my habits. Extremely awkward for me to come away from the office, particularly with Siam at present state. Oh, dear me. Yeah, sit down, Mycroft, sit down. Uh, you know Watson, of course. Yes, yes, yes of course. Uh, I'm trying to find a chair that I can trust to hold me. Yeah, I'd better take the sofa. You certainly haven't got any thinner. I've never seen the Prime Minister so upset. As for the Admiralty, it's buzzing like an upset beehive. You know anything about the case? Uh, Watson's just been telling me what was in the newspapers. Uh, just what were the technical papers found on the body? Sherlock, for the love of heaven, not so loud. Those papers which the wretched youth had in his pocket were none other than the plans of the Bruce Partington submarine. Oh? The submarine which would completely revolutionize naval warfare. The most important papers in our government archives. Under no circumstances could they be removed from the office. Even the chief constructor of the Navy was forced to go to Woolwich if he desired to consult them. And yet we find them in the pockets of a dead junior clerk in the heart of London. Yeah, from an official point of view, it's deplorable, my dear Mycroft. Simply deplorable. You may laugh, Sherlock, but this country won't be safe until they are recovered. But I thought you said that they were found in the pocket of this chap, Cadogan West. Ten papers taken from Woolwich. Seven were found in the pockets of Cadogan West. Three are still missing, the three essential ones. To recover those p three papers is imperative. The peace of Europe depends on... Mm, nice little problem, eh, Watson? Why did Cadogan West take the papers? How did he die... 
How did his body reach the place where it was found? And where are the missing papers? Find the answer to those questions, Sherlock, and you'll have done your country an invaluable service. Oh, why don't you solve it yourself, Mycroft? I believe you could. Mm, possibly. But it's a question of digging out details. Give me the details and I can give you the solution from an armchair. No, when it comes to running about and cross-questioning railway guards and lying on one's face with a lens to one's eye... <laughs> no, no, that's not my nature. <laughs> Besides, your, your figure prevents your taking such an undignified position, eh? <laughs> Very well. Leave that part of it was, eh, Watson? That's <laughs> sure. Good. I've got a cab waiting outside to take the place where the body was found. I can give you the details on the way. <laughs> Who was the official guardian of these famous papers? No less a personage than Sir James Walter, a gentleman who's grown grey in the service. His patriotism is beyond suspicion. A bachelor, if I'm not mistaken, lives with his brother. Yes. He was the house of Admiral Sinclair at Berkeley Square during the whole of the evening when this accident occurred. The Admiral vouches for him. He's one of the two who have the only keys to save. And his key was with him all evening? Right. His key, the key to the building, the key to the room. Mm. Who was the man with the other key? The senior clerk, Mr. Sidney Johnson. Man of 40, married, silent, morose, with an excellent service record. Any alibi? He too had his key with him and seems to have spent the evening playing a game of drafts with a green grocer around the corner from his lodgings. Of course, he has only the word of this green grocer to back him oh, up. Oh, come, come, my dear Mycroft. No class discriminations, please. The word of a green grocer is often just as good as that of an admiral. Now, what about Cadogan West? He had a good reputation. A bit hot headed, but straight and honest. At least, everyone thought so. He was next to Sidney Johnson at the office. His duties brought him into daily personal contact with the plans. No one else ever had the handling of them. Oh, it's perfectly clear. He must have taken... Ah, oh, not so fast, Watson. Not so fast. Who locked them up that night? Mr. Sidney Johnson. Ah. They were of value. Commercially, I mean. Oh, yes. There's no doubt that West could have got several thousands for them very easily. And yet, only a small amount of money was found on the body. Perhaps the buyer took it back after he'd murdered West. Ah, what puzzles me is, how did West obtain possession of those papers? To do so, he must have had a false key. Several false keys, Sherlock. He had to open the building and the room as well. Oh, well, well, well. Several false keys, then. Let me see, let me see. Suppose West did take the papers and went into town. And on the way back to Woolwich, where he is hoping to replace the papers, he's killed and thrown from the train. But the spot where the body was found is considerably past the station for London Bridge, which is the route to Woolwich. Ah, that's interesting. Also, if young West did make an appointment with some foreign agent to sell the papers that night, why didn't he keep the evening clear? Why buy two theater tickets? Exactly. Furthermore, he actually escorted his fiancée halfway there before he disappeared. A blind. That's what it looks like to me. Why did he take the papers at all? Why not copy them out in the office and sell the copies? He certainly had plenty of opportunity to do so. And why the absence of his underground ticket? Perhaps the ticket would have shown us which station was near the agent's house. So the murderer destroyed it. Good, Watson. Very good. <laughs> and yet... I wonder. Huh? Well, here's the underground station. The railway authorities have sent a man round to show you the exact place where the body was found. You won't change your mind and come with us? Well, crawling round that black hole on my hands and knees, <laughs> not very likely. Well, I shall expect a report on your efforts this evening. I uh, never expect too much, Mycroft. Never expect too much. <laughs> Before we follow Holmes and Watson into the mazes of the London subway system, I have a word of advice. Every year, colds cause a lot of sickness. Every year, they cause a lot of expense and time lost from work. Always regard a cold seriously. Always treat it earnestly. At the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are famous relief for the distress of a cold. Their efficacy has been fully established. Bromoquinine tablets go right to work on a cold symptom. They don't waste any time. They don't pull any punches. They quickly relieve the misery of a cold. They help reduce the fever of a cold. Thousands of people keep bromoquinine tablets handy all winter. Thousands of people depend on them as their relief for colds. No other preparation enjoys greater confidence than bromoquinine tablets. Follow the example of millions, and at the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Get them at any drugstore, a few cents a box. Ask specifically for Groves, G-R-O-V-E-S. Bromo, B-R-O-M-O. Quinine, Q-U-I-N-I-N-E. Groves, Bromo, Quinine tablets. This way, sir. 
Step right along the tracks. But it isn't safe. Supposing a train should come shooting round that curve. Oh, that's all right, sir. There won't be another for five minutes anyway. Here we are, sir. This is where they found the body. Right here alongside the rails. Lying on its face, it was. Mm, spooky old place, eh, Holmes? Like the catacombs, only without the skeletons. Yeah. Anything in his hands when they found him? No, sir. Were they clenched? Or spread out as if he were protecting himself? No, sir. They was what you might call relaxed. Ah. What time did all this happen? Well, sir, the train he was hoisted out of, as near as we can figure, passed along here at about midnight on Monday. All the carriages have been examined for signs of violence, I suppose. They didn't find nothing. Not even the missing ticket. There was a passenger to Allgate on the ordinary train. About 11.40 it was. He said he'd heard a heavy thud, like something striking the line, just before the train reached this station. But it was so foggy, he said he was blessed if he could see what it was. Holmes, what's the matter? What are you staring at? The curve, Watson. The what curve of the rails. What other? What do you, what do you mean? I suppose there aren't many curves as abrupt as this. No, sir, I can't say as there is. What have curves got to do with it? Oh, an indication, Watson, merely an indication. Hmm, unique. Perfectly unique. And yet, why not? I don't see any indications of bleeding on the line. No, sir, there wasn't any to speak of. But I understand there was a considerable wound. The bone was crashed right enough. Holmes, you hear that? It's a train. It's, it's coming this way. Run, sir. Run for your life. Yes, this would where? Uh, up ahead. There's a place where the train switches off. Run, Watson, run. It's just around the curve. Well, we'll, we'll never make it. We, yes, we will. Faster, faster. Uh, there's the switch up ahead. Come on. Here comes the train now. We'll make it. We'll make it. Ah, Justin. Watson, for the love of heaven. You're on the wrong track. <laughs> That was a narrow escape, Holmes. I, I must say my knees are still shaking. Look at the shoulder of my coat where you pull it there. Lucky thing for you that I did. Where are we off to now in, in this fog? Yes, it's a nice afternoon. Suppose we pay a few calls. I think Sir James Walter claims our first attention. After that, we might drop in on Miss Westbury. Miss Westbury? Who's she? She is Cadogan West's fiance and the last person to see him alive. Holmes, we seem to be going around in circles. We've accomplished absolutely nothing so far except to get, to, to get ourselves nearly annihilated in the underground. After all, it's perfectly obvious that the young man had a quarrel with someone, in all probability to the agent, to whom he sold the papers, and got himself thrown out of the railway carriage for his pay. I disagree with you, my dear Watson. His body fell from the roof of the carriage where it had been placed. Cadogan West met his death elsewhere. The roof of the train? Consider the facts, Watson. A. The curve in the tracks. The body is found at a spot where the train pitches and sways as it comes around the points. B. There was no ticket. C. There were no signs of bleeding on the line because the body had bled elsewhere. Of course. Everything fits together, but... But where was the body placed on the train? I think I can make a fair guess of that, my dear Watson. Ah, oh, here we are. This is the famous official villa of Sir James Walter. And that, if I'm not mistaken, is his brother, Colonel Valentine, just coming out of the house. What's the matter with the man? He, he looks positively haunted. Oh, uh, pardon me, Colonel Valentine, but can you tell me if, uh, if Sir James is at home? Uh, Sir James, sir? Sir James is dead. Good heavens, dead. He died this morning. It's terrible. Terrible. How did he die? Oh, it's this horrible scandal. My brother, sir, was very sensitive of his honor. He couldn't survive the disgrace to his department. It broke his heart. Pardon me, gentlemen, I must go. It, it broke his heart. Most appalling development. Eh, Holmes? Mm. I wonder if his death was natural or if the poor fellow killed himself. <laughs> You tell Miss Westbury that Mr. Sherlock Holmes would like to see her? Oh, please come in, gentlemen. I'm Val Westbury, Mr. Holmes. I've been expecting you ever since I heard you had taken the case. Please be seated. Oh, thank you. Oh, Mr. Holmes, we, we must save his good name. He couldn't have done it. Cadogan was the most chivalrous patriotic gentleman on earth. He, he couldn't have done it. He would have cut his right hand off rather than sell a state secret. But the facts, my dear Miss Westbury. I admit I can't explain them. Uh, was he in need of money? No, Mr. Holmes. His need was simple and his salary very good. He'd saved several hundred pounds. We were to be married at the new year. I see. Had you noticed any signs of mental excitement? Why, I... Well, that is... Uh, come, Miss Westbury, be frank with us. Yes, Mr. Holmes. That night, I... I had a feeling that there was something on his mind. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it, will you? We were on the way to the theater. It was a foggy night, you remember? We were walking slowly... Our way took us close to his office. 
Cadogan seems thoughtful and worried. Darling, what's the matter? You haven't said a word for the last five minutes. Have I said or done something? Of course not, silly. It's just that I've got something on my mind. Oh, why not tell me about it? Perhaps I can help. It's no use, Vi. It's too serious for me to talk about, even to you. You know, sometimes, Caddy, I feel just the least little bit jealous of that old job of yours. When you're cooped up in that building all day. Oh, no, you're not going to be jealous of a building. <laughs> well, not really. But it is funny to think of a husband having secrets he can't tell his wife. Mighty important secrets, I can promise you. There's one in particular that any foreign spy would pay good money to get hold of. How thrilling. Well, I don't know. They're awfully slack about some things over there in that building, Violet. What's too slack? It would be too confounded easy for a traitor to get his hands on those plans. What plans? Oh, never mind, darling. I guess I'm getting a bit melodramatic. But there's something been worrying me. Hello, what's that? What's what? Over there, that shadow moving along the side of the building. It's a man. So that's it. I always suspected... Oh, what's the matter? You're so excited. What's wrong? Stay here, Violet. There's something I have to find out. Stay here. I waited and waited, but he never returned. Oh, Mr. Holmes, if you could only save his honor, it, it meant so much to him. We shall do our best, Miss Westbury. This, um, this shadow, this man moving along the building, did you see it too? I think I did, Mr. Holmes. But the night was so foggy, I can't be sure. But there must have been a man. Another man. It, it couldn't have been Cadogan. Surely character goes for something. Let us hope so. Come along, Watson. We must return home. I'm expecting an answer to some telegrams I sent Mycroft earlier this afternoon. We've done enough for one day. All day. You left this morning before I was up. Now you've come home with your towel awry, your suit torn, and as ravenous as a wolf. <laughs> yes. I've had a bit of exercise, my dear Watson. Uh, pass me the tongue, will you? It would have done you good to go along. Yes, what were you doing? Investigating the premises inhabited by foreign spies known to have been in London on last Monday. Mycroft sent me a list of them. Took a bit of doing, too. Climbing walls, breaking into cellars, prowling around rooftops. Well? I discovered there was only one residence which had the uh, proper facilities for disposing of West's body after the murder. Well, whose residence was that? It belongs to a Hugo Oberstein. The address is 13 Caulfield Gardens, Kensington. The gentleman himself has departed for Europe. Gone, has he? And he took the plans with him. It's, it's too late. Not necessarily, Watson. What can we do now? We're going to keep a rendezvous with the gentleman who stole and sold those plans. The assignation will take place at Mr. Oberstein's house this evening at nine. What the deuce are you talking about? Uh, these newspaper clippings. I found them in the drawer of Hugo Oberstein's desk. Read them. Hmm. In the Daily Telegraph agony column, the first one says, Too complex a description must have full report. Terms agreed to. Payable when goods delivered. Signed, Piero. Piero, indeed. Sounds like a Mardi Gras. Now, read on, Watson. Read on. Second goes, Matter presses must withdraw for unless contract completed. Piero again. And the last, dated Monday, the day the crime was committed. Monday night after nine, two taps, payment in hard cash. I say, do you think it was a submarine that, that the plans that, that he was buying? I'm almost positive. And Piero was Oberstein himself. But we'll find out for certain this evening. I've invited the gentleman who sold the papers to meet us. Well, how? I don't understand. I inserted this advertisement in today's Daily Telegraph. Tonight, same hour, same place, two taps, vitally important. Your own safety at stake. Signed, Piero, as usual. George, if he answers that, we've, we've got him. Unless we're too late. Come along, Watson. There's no time to lose. You can take this passage, uh, pa package for a change. I'll, uh, I've been carrying it around all day. What's in it? Oh, just a jemmy, a dark lantern, a chisel, and a revolver. Nice equipment for a respectable citizen to be carrying about the streets of London. I must... Yeah, you know, Watson, there are times when I suspect we aren't quite respectable. <laughs> This is Coffee Gardens. Thank heavens, it's still foggy. I shouldn't like to be caught in the act of housebreaking. Yeah. Over this wall, Watson. There's a window we can easily pry open in the back. Scale that wall? Oh, come on, hurry up, hurry up. There's no time to lose. Here, here. I'll give you a boost. <clears throat> come on, up here. <clears throat> That's it. Look out, here I come. I must say, Holmes, you're as agile as a cat. <laughs> it's uncanny. This is the window. Light the lantern and give me the jemmy. One. Two. The underground runs right past here, almost on the level of these windows. I could reach out and touched it. Yes, quite convenient, wasn't it? It was here the body was placed on the roof of the train. Look out of this, uh, look on this window sill. Hmm? You can see the soot is blurred where the rest of the body. And here, look here, look, look. This brown stain is blood. Mm, nasty, eh, Holmes? Let's, let's get on to the house. Very well, then. Come along, come along. 
The window's open. Easy, easy. Don't break the glass. Supposing Augustine should happen to return home. Well, we must take our chances in this business. Come along, Watson. Come along. My visitor will expect to be let in by the front door. I wish these stairs didn't, didn't squeak so. Nine o'clock. We can expect him at any moment now. You take your position on one side of the door. I'll be on the other. So we can pounce on him when he enters. I'll throw my greatcoat over his head. Oh, well, I, I wish he'd hurry. Shh, Watson. Well, what, what if he doesn't come? There he is. Ready now. I'll open the door. You wanted me? No, you don't. Take that. What the hell Easy, Watson, easy. All right, Holmes, I've got him. Well, let's take a look at our catch. Take the overcoat away, Watson. Right. Hi. It's, uh, it's Colonel Valentine Walk. Walter. Sir James's brother. Quite. Well, sir, what have you to say for yourself? Why did you steal the Bruce Partington plans? Oh, you... What do you know about this? I am Sherlock Holmes, and I know everything. Oh, this is terrible. I'm lost. I didn't realize their importance until my brother killed himself. But I needed the money. I had to have it. Oberstein offered to give it to me if I'd let him see the plans. So you took an impression of your brother's key, opened the safe, and procured the papers. Cadogan West saw you leaving the building, followed you here, and you killed him. No, I didn't do that. I swear I didn't do it. No? Then perhaps you'd better tell us who did murder Cadogan West and placed him on the roof of the railway carriage. I'll tell you. I promise you I will. I did the rest. I confess it, but but not that. Very well, then. How did it happen? I got the papers, as you've discovered. Made my way through the fog until I reached the door. Once or twice, I fancied I was being followed. I could hear footsteps on the pavement behind me. Colonel Walter? Yes. Do you have the papers? Yes. Let me in, quick. I think someone's been following me. Yes, it's me. Yes. You can't do this, Valentine. It's treason. All right, do you hear? No, you can't sell the papers, Valentine. I won't let you. They should see. Look out, Wes. Take that. How do you like that, my impetuous young friend? Papa Oberstein, he knows how to use a blackjack, eh? You, you, you've killed him. So? It's murder. I'm going to get out of this. Oh, no. I think different. You will come in here if you do not wish to taste a blackjack, too. But I... I... But... That is better. Oh, what can we do? They'll find the body. I have an idea. First, I look at those papers. I take the ones I want and the rest you put in the pocket of this foolish young man. And then we give him a nice ride on top of the underground train, no? He will be the guilty one. Who will ever know? What a thoroughly unpleasant gentleman. What a pity that he got away with the papers, Dr. Watson. Oh, but he didn't. Augustine had left a Paris forwarding address with Colonel Walters. That gentleman sent him a letter dictated by Holmes, saying that he had discovered that one essential detail in the plans was missing, and that he had procured a tracing which would make it complete for a price. And did Augustine swallow the bait? <laughs> did he swallow it? He was arrested as he got off the boat at Folkestone. Some weeks later, I learned incidentally that Holmes had spent a day at Windsor Castle and returned with a remarkably fine emerald type-in. When I asked him where he got it, he answered that it was just a small present from a certain gracious little old lady for whom he'd been able to do a, a small f favor. Yes, and I think I can guess the lady's august name. Elementary, my dear Mr. Manning, elementary. I see. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. In the meantime, let us repeat. Watch out for colds. At the first sign of a cold... Take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are made especially for the relief of colds. In other words, they're specialized medication, and that's what you want. Yes, at the very first sneeze or sniffle, go right to your druggist and get a package of Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Now, Dr. Watson, next week? Next week, I think I'll tell you the story of the lion's mane. The lion's mane? What was that, Dr. Watson? Well, the answer to that question, Mr. Manning, almost stumped Sherlock Holmes himself. Suffice it to say that they were the last words gasped out by a dying man as he lay writhing in agony on the sands of the Sussex coast. You have been listening to a Sherlock Holmes adventure adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Bruce Partington Plans, with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. The dramatization was by Edith Miser. This program is presented from Hollywood every week at this same time by the makers of Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Quick relief for colds. This is Knox Manning speaking. <laughs>
Welcome back. Um, this this was uh, this was a, a very solid production. Um, having watched several of the of the Rathbone Bruce movies, Rathbone's voice sounds a little bit different over the the radio than it did in film for some reason. Um, but I thought this was just a very solid uh, uh, performance of the story. One thing you notice here, and a lot of the early Sherlock Holmes movies have this, uh, is the uh, flashbacks uh, while somebody's telling the story rather than just, um, you know, saying this is what happened. Uh, by the way, regarding Quinine, I, I should probably say this, Quinine is actually no longer available as an over-the-counter medicine. Um, you got That's prescription only. Uh, now, that's something that was changed back in the 80s because uh, there were some uh, medical so uh, side effects. So the FDA so, uh, put that regulation on, at least in the United States, where you cannot get quinine over the counter anymore. All right, well, before we go, I want to encourage you, um, if, you if you love uh, Sherlock Holmes and all the great movies and adaptations that have been made about him, uh, then I, uh, including the Basil Rathbone ones, then I have got a strong recommendation uh, for you to go out and you to try Netflix. With Netflix, you're able to uh, access classic films um, such as the Rathbone films, Christopher Lee, uh, all of the Sherlock Holmes that you want uh, to be able to make a good comparison. Uh, you, and you can, can try Netflix out for two weeks and see if I'm right about it. Uh, just go to netflix.greatdetectives.net, netflix.greatdetectives.net, uh, to start your two-week free trial. Um, I use it, I re and I strongly recommend it. Try Netflix. All, uh, it's, and it, unlike Quanine, it is perfectly legal with the FDA. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to let you know about something I found. Uh, for those of you who are fans of radio drama, uh, I located a, an online radio station for the BBC. It's called BBC Radio 7. Uh, and at uh, Radio 7, you can play a wide variety of different radio shows. Uh, they're released on a regular basis, and they are uh, available for seven days after release. And you can just listen to them on the website. Of course, they're not all necessarily family-friendly, so listener discretion is advised. But it's a nice resource. I'll include it in the show notes, but you can find it on Google as well just by searching for BBC Radio 7, a wide variety of different programs. All right, well, uh, let me go ahead and we will get into today's comments. Hey, Adam, love the new show. I was listening to the Charles Russell episode of the Milford Brooks III matter, and I had a question. Did Bob Bailey play Milford Brooks III? It sure sounded like him. It sounded to me like there were two Johnny D Dollars. Keep up the good work. Uh, thanks a lot, Lance. As far as I know, I would answer no. Um, it, did, it didn't sound like that to me. And in addition to that... Uh, Dennis at the Digital Deli, he's got a definitive uh, radiography on a lot of these stars, and he does not have that as a Bob Bailey credit. Bob Bailey's first appearance on Johnny Dollar was in the starring role in 1955. It can be kind of tough when you're listening to unfamiliar voice actors in a show that doesn't that doesn't list the stars. So uh, on. Uh, in the credits uh, at the end, like the later Johnny Dollar episodes do. But, no, I don't believe Bob Bailey was in that. In addition, at the time, he was working for the Don Lee Mutual Network. So I'm not certain uh, I'm not certain how that would would have uh, worked. And, yeah, I would lean towards that not, not being the case, particularly since he was uh, the lead on another detective show. It would be kind of weird to go over and help CBS getting a competing show started. So, yeah, I would lean towards no on that. Uh, he also says he likes the new theme music. It's sort of a techno-noir sound. Well, thanks. And as I mentioned before, that actually came 
uh, from the um, uh, that actually came from an episode of Pat Novak for Hire. Uh, uh, anyway, um, we did get a comment on Podcast Alley that added some insight to last week's episode of uh, Box 13. Uh, Statlander writes, this host tries hard, but sometimes he misses the point. For example, the funny thing about the Box 13 with the humor directed at the short detective is the fact that Alan Ladd was himself short. Uh, he hit this by appearing on the screen with very short Co-starters. Veronica Light was less than five feet tall. Is he spreading himself too thin? Perhaps. No, no, it's not too thin. It was just that I was a little short of information. Um, I, I, I'd actually read that. I think that fact about Lad's height, and I had uh, forgotten it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that that does make sense. And I looked it up. Alan Lad was five foot five inches tall. And it kind of kind of makes uh, raises some interesting questions as to whether early television was perhaps a little more superficial than um, than early movies. Because you think about it, Alan Ladd was five five, which is fairly short. Had a great career in uh, films. Uh, Humphrey Bogart, of course, was five eight. Uh, he wore some ridiculous shoes, uh, but he was still about uh, to get up to 5'10", but he was he was still 5'8". Um, and Bob Bailey was 5'9", and couldn't make it on TV. So, it's kind of like, were they more superficial on television about the hot thing? But I do appreciate the comments, and I always appreciate to learn from listeners as well. All right, well, Linda Holt writes that she loves Johnny Dollar, so we're going to go ahead and get into it. Uh, this episode of Johnny Dollar is called The Case of the $100,000 Legs. Now, I should mention that we did have a missing episode in between. The Case of the Foxy Terrier, uh, the, uh, the eighth episode of the Charles Russell uh, run, is actually missing. So this is the ninth episode, The Case of the $100,000 uh, Legs. We will go ahead and listen, and then we'll come back. Time now for Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he's just an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Home Office, I were the Insurance Underwriters Association, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, General Manager Harvey Anthony. Hmm, <clears throat> uh, dear Mr. Anthony, here is your problem. The following is an accounting of my expenditures in the case of the $100,000 leg. Or who put your company out on the limb? Expense account, item one $60. $20 across the board on a losing horse I was rushed into betting on when you had me paged on a public address system at the racetrack. This is Harvey Anthony, Dollar. Thanks for calling back so soon. Now, when they paged me, they said it was an emergency. It better be. Why? What's the matter, Dollar? This is my day off. And if I know you, this call is going to make it an off day. <laughs> if I know you, my friend, you won't mind this assignment. I want you to go out to Hollywood. Act as a bodyguard for a big movie star, Marilyn Major. Oh, not a bad body to guard. What's the deal? We've issued one of those publicity policies. Insured her legs for 100000 Policy will only be in effect for 48 hours. We want you to stick with her. Just to uh, see that she doesn't get mixed up in any hockey games. <laughs> I get it. She's been notified, so she expects you. Now, when do the 48 hours start? Tomorrow noon. Can you make it? Now, with the help of American Airlines. Got enough cash with you to buy your ticket? Uh, about that, I'll know right after the next race. I'll call you from Hollywood. Expense account, item two. 
$10. Borrowed from a friend. Taxi fare from the racetrack to town, where I cash check to pay item three. $186.13. Plane fare, Hartford to Hollywood. Item four, three fifty. Cab fare, Los Angeles Municipal Airport to the home of the insured. Miss Marilyn Major at the Horizon View Apartments on the Sunset Strip. Hit the driver, one dollar. Miss Major's apartment had the best view of the horizon, it being the penthouse. But her outlook was anything but rosy. I found the apartment door open. First I looked in, then I went in. I want to place a person-to-person call, please, to Mr. Harvey Anthony at Hartford, Connecticut. Volunteer uh, 3 6000. My name is Dollar, as in blood money. While I was waiting to get Mr. Anthony, I wondered who had got Miss Major. In the movies, I'd always thought she looked right at home anywhere. And now, right there in front of me, she was passing her toughest test, lying there nice and relaxed. She looked right at home in the role of a beautiful gal who has just been murdered. Her face was calm. Her legs were neatly placed in the best of cheesecake tradition. The only thing not quite as it should have been was a very real bullet hole, which she was wearing where an earring should have been. But the next cameras that would be taking her picture would be police cameras. B pictures. B for bloody. Mr. Dollar? Oh, yeah? Here's your party. Go ahead. Oh. Hello? Hello? Hello, Dollar? Yeah, yeah, this is Dollar, all right. Anthony, first I want to tell you, those legs you insured are still in beautiful shape. Good, good, fine. I only hope you didn't also insure Miss Major's life. She's dead. What? Marilyn Major dead? That's right. Oh, we certainly do insure her life. We only issued that publicity policy on her legs as a courtesy. Dollar, get to work on it right away. I'll get to work on it, but don't waste too much hope. To me, it looks like your only out is if the policy does not pay off on murder. Murder? Well, there may be something about the case that will save us from paying double indemnity for death by violence. Oh, this is death by violence, brother, any way you look at it. Okay, Anthony, I'll get to work on it right after I call the cops and make a report. Do your best. Goodbye. Okay, goodbye. Hang up that telephone, mister. The dame standing in the kitchen doorway had thirty-two caliber steel in her hand to back up the brass in her voice. She was a youngster, but obviously an old-timer at a lot of things. Her hair was the same color as the murdered woman's, smoke blonde, and her dress was tobacco brown and round and firm and fully packed. I said put down that phone. Yeah, sure, sure, okay. Now, uh, you, you do me a favor, will you? If you feel you want your finger near that trigger... How about moving it up to the front end of the trigger guard, huh? Mister, I only heard part of what you said, but you're not calling no police. What makes you think so? That dame in there's done me enough harm. I came here to kill her, but somebody beat me to it, and I'm not taking the rap. Okay, so beat it. Who cares? Then I'll call the police. Somebody's going to eventually. Before I go, I'm finding a few things and taking them with me. Now, come on, get up on your feet, mister. You're coming with me in the bedroom. Okay, okay, don't get excited. Okay, mister, over against that wall with your face in close and your hands straight up. Come on, move. All right. You learn this at the movies or by watching your friends work. Don't be a wise guy. I'm not as dumb as I look. Now, hold still. Look, uh, sister, by this time I shouldn't still like you well enough to warn you, but what you're doing right now will get you in plenty of trouble, even if you didn't commit this murder. I'll take that chance. If you don't get picked up for larceny, they'll still get you for tampering with evidence. As far as the police are concerned, at the scene of a murder, nothing gets touched. They like it that way. What I'm taking won't even be missed. There are plenty more here just like him. That's all she's gotten here. Love letters from men. Who are you covering up for? Your boyfriend? It's none of your business, mister, but it's my husband I'm covering up for. Oh, well, then you're just plain nuts. If he knew her, they'll find that out. And then if they want him, they'll find him. Yeah, then they'll find him dead. Huh? My husband committed suicide over that... No good dame this morning. Oh. Now, I've I've had enough out of you. Back up. Two steps. Okay. Now, get over there and into that closet. Come on. Too bad. What's the matter? I always feel sorry for a sucker. I felt around in the dark, 
It was a small faucet. That meant not much air. That meant doing something about it. I took my fingernail file, stood it on edge, and slipped it under the door, pressing down the nap of the rug. I did the same with my fountain pen. That would at least allow a small supply of air to sneak into my stuffy little cell. And then I glued my ear to the thin wooden panel that separated me from the bedroom. It wasn't long before my captor apparently completed his search. I heard her pass the closet door and head for the front room. I didn't hear her dial the phone, but it didn't take me long to realize that's what she was doing and who she was calling. Give me the police. This is an emergency. Hello? Hello, police? I want to report a murder. All right. Hello? There's been a murder. The movie star Marilyn Major in the penthouse. The Horizon View apartment on the Sunset Strip. Never mind who I am. I've caught the murderer. You'll find him locked up in the closet. From the moment she hung up, I could only guess what was happening. I heard a man's footsteps rush in and then his voice. Blackmail me, will you, you cheap little boy? That's what I'm saying you for these letters. Now I'm taking them with me. I didn't think I had the time to spend picking the lock on the closet door, so I started kicking. <laughs> the girl who had just tried to turn me into the cops was lying on her face in front of the telephone stand, and a covey of bullets had turned the brown silk on her back into wet red lace. She'd been shot in the back, and if she succeeded in finding her letters, her killer had taken them with him. I made a quick search myself and took a look through the remaining sets of letters, one from a guy who signed himself Baron, and the other one from a guy whose autograph read, With all my love, Lawrence. My instincts were trying to pull me out of that apartment, but one look down the street threw them into reverse. Black and white prowl cars were arriving, and it was less than another minute when their passengers started pouring out of the elevator and through the front door. <laughs> In the bedroom closet, boys, make sure you don't stand in front of that door. Okay, Never mind the closet, Lieutenant. It's empty. I kicked my way out. All right, let's see your hands. Get them up. I swear I'm going to buy some stock in a gun company. Everybody's got them. Miller, get around behind him. Check him for the weapons. Yes, sir. He's clean, Lieutenant. Okay. Who are you? Johnny Dollar. And if you lend me back my right hand, I'll give you my ID. It's in my wallet. Keep him up. Miller, get his wallet. Yes, sir. Here it is. Oh. Insurance, Dick, huh? Please, I'm a freelance special insurance investigator. It sounds better. Keeps my price up. Hartford, huh? Well, what's your story? Well, first, I'd like to go on record as saying I didn't commit either one of the murders. Either one? What are you talking about? Well, this one here is the girl who phoned in the report that brought you here. The one she was talking about, Marilyn Major, is lying just as dead on the floor in the bedroom. No, no. Get in there and take a look. Yes, sir. While he's looking, you keep on talking. Okay. I'll start from the beginning. I was sent out here by Highworthy Insurance. They just issued a policy on the legs of that dame in the other room. A hundred thousand dollars. Publicity stunt. I was supposed to protect their interests. What do you mean by that? Well, what do you think? I was supposed to see that she didn't attempt any Hindu fire dances or try walking any tightropes during the next 48 hours. Well, your worries are over that department at least. What else? When I got here, the door was open. I walked in and found her. Dead. Any way to prove that? Any witnesses? Uh, just one. She's lying there behind her. Uh-huh. Over the phone, she accused you of the murder. That's the wrong kind of a witness. No, Lieutenant. The wrong kind of dame. She knew I didn't do it. She was somewhere in this apartment when I arrived. Then why did she say it? I can hardly ask her. Listen, Lieutenant. She did tell me that she came here to get some letters. Her husband had written them to the major dame. She said she was trying to protect him. From what? Who knows? Maybe she just wanted him to rest in peace. The guy committed suicide this morning. Well, we can't check his story with him, can we? You've got a lot of dead friends. How did this one here get that way? I'm not sure. While I was in the closet, I heard her call you. And then a man came in and yelled something about blackmail at her and shot her. And naturally, he had disappeared by the time you kicked your way out of the closet. That's right. Yeah. This story of yours may win some kind of a prize, Dollar, but not for me. I'm not a judge. That's one thing in my favor. Hey, Lieutenant, I got something. The dame is dead, all right. And look what I found in that closet. A fingernail file, a fountain pen with a name on it, Johnny Dollar, and a thirty-two caliber revolver jammed in a shoe. Well, Dollar, 
That combination puts you in a kind of jam, too. Look, Lieutenant, I think I can make you see things my way if you let me go through my story once more. I was sent out here by Highworth, the insurance center, right at the time. Expense account, item four, $3. Candy, gum, cigarettes, and magazines to make cell number 36, Los Angeles City Jail. Less like a no place and more like a home. There's something about a jail door closing on you that sounds very final. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, we want you to know that the biggest jackpot in the history of radio, $50,000, goes in the works tomorrow night when CBS' great Saturday night quiz show, Sing It Again, comes to you again over most of these same stations. $50,000, $25,000 in marvelous prizes, plus $25,000 in cold, hard cash. And that's only the beginning, because the longer the phantom voice questions elude the listeners, the higher the rewards go. Be sure you're around tomorrow night. When Sing It Again sets telephones ringing across the nation and $50,000 goes riding on each call. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. When I accepted this Hollywood assignment, I visualized spending much of my time gazing upon bars but not the kind offered by cell number 36. The guy who said stone walls do not a prison mate had never been a guest in the Los Angeles City Jail. He had a better chance of getting out of Bartlett's quotations than I had of getting out of there. But as we keep saying in the insurance racket, never say die. Lieutenant Roach, what are you in for? I've heard tell the boys around headquarters have a very funny joke about roaches in jails. But that's not why I'm here. Sit down. Make yourself uncomfortable. Thanks. I can't offer you a mint julep. The closest I can come is a spearmint lifesaver. Oh, thanks. Well, this kind of zero is a pleasure after facing the kind we're up against. Huh? So for a dollar, all we've got to go on is you and a mess of evidence we haven't as yet been able to trace down to its rightful owners. Well, incidentally, about that gun we thought might be yours. Oh, don't tell me you're going to give it to me as a birthday present. It was the weapon used to kill Marilyn Major, all right. The paraffin test we took in your hands let you out. You haven't been firing any guns lately. Does that mean you've come here to escort me to the front door? No, not so fast. We do want to know what your fingerprints were doing all over those two bundles of love letters we found. I'm going to have to learn to pick things up with my knuckles. Lieutenant, I just had a natural curiosity as to who killed the cat. The only difference between us, Roach, is that your curiosity is official. How far did you get? Uh, Not far enough. Didn't take much figuring to know that Miss Major has been playing a high-class badger game. All the perfume in the joint couldn't cover up the smell of blackmail. On top of that, we found the two batches of letters that you'd been messing around with. One signed Baron, the other signed Lawrence. Those the fire department should be handling. Oh, yeah. Oh, and remember, there's probably a third set floating around. Why do you say that? Well, I'm not an eyewitness to this, only an ear witness. But uh, from what I could hear inside that closet, the dame who came there looking for her husband's letters found them, and she called you to turn me in. Mm-hmm. On our way out of the apartment, some guy came in, stuck her for Marilyn Major, and shot her on the back. When I kicked my way out of the closet, those letters of hers were gone. So, figures the murderer grabbed the letters out of her hand, thinking there was some he'd written. Uh-huh. Then in your file, the killer was either that Baron fellow or the, the other one, uh, Lawrence. Lieutenant, in my file, they're both murderers. It's just a question of who killed whom. The guy who killed Marilyn Major certainly wouldn't have come back to kill her again, would he? In this town, you never know. Look, Lieutenant, I got a two-way stake in this thing. One to get my name cleared, the other to get my job done. And I'm in a hurry. I imagine you are, too. 
Well, Marilyn Major was a big name. That means we'll soon have newspapers burning under our seats. We're in a hurry, all right. Okay, then listen. If I were either one of those murderers, and I know that the police probably had a handful of letters that could send me to the gas chamber, I'd head for the border. Yeah. But if I thought an outsider had them, somebody they might be able to buy off or scare off or beat off, then I'd go find that guy. Well? Let's bring this thing to a head in a hurry. Run a story in the papers. Tell them, tell them you released me. Uh, tell them I escaped. Tell them anything. Just so long as you tell them that you suspect that I have those letters hidden someplace. Well, if you don't mind taking the chance of having two murderers gunning after you, we certainly don't. Oh, I mind. Believe me, I'm not doing you any favors. It's just that I'll feel safer in my own hands. Okay, Mr. Pigeon, you've got yourself elected. We'll publish that story. Then we'll let you fry the coop. Good enough. Just make sure that you give me plenty of fighter cover. Expense account, item six, seven cents. Purchase of newspaper, an extra edition that hit the street about a half an hour before I did. Item seven, five dollars. A big square meal to make up for the ones I'd missed, ignoring the little round beans while a guest of the city. Seeing the lieutenant's fiction in black print on the front page of a newspaper almost had me believing it. There was my picture, big as life. And when those birds set up a pigeon, they made sure everybody would know the location of his roost. Firmly planted high in the story was the name of the hotel to which they had registered me, and to which I was under orders to proceed immediately. As I walked down the hotel corridor to my room, I felt an icy chill and a flight of goose flesh headed south down my spine. Expected company, but not your kind. At first, I thought I'd gotten into the wrong room. This kid looked right at home. And she used some, some of the clothes from a half-packed overnight bag to make her look it. So you're Johnny Doe. Yeah. Thanks for saving me a calling card. Who are you? Alice Hill. That doesn't mean anything. Otherwise known as Mrs. Lawrence Hill. Oh, Lawrence. Oh, the last time I saw that name, it said, with love. But not to you. That's why I'm here. I want those letters. Why aren't you carrying a gun? It'll be here if we need it. We? Yes. My husband's down in the lobby. Look, if you give me those letters he wrote, I'll pack up my little bag and leave, and everybody will be very happy. Yeah? I think I know the next line, but go ahead. I hope you keep on being that smart. My husband was watching for you when you came in, so he knows you're up here. Naturally, he knows I'm here, and he's on his way up. We want this. This isn't just a badger game. This is the World Series. If I don't give you the letters, your husband busts in here, shoots me, and I get written off under the unwritten law. Neat, neat, neat. It's a handy law. You're right. It's covered a multitude of sins. Where are the letters? Where's your husband? What's the matter with you? What do those letters mean to you? Well, right now, they look like my only hold on the future, Mrs. Hill. How do I know that you and your dear Lawrence won't kill me after you get them? Do you want me to take your word for it? Well, I... I I'll have to trust Lawrence. He'll know what to do. I already know. There's nothing else for him to do. Look, Mrs. Hill, why don't you wise up? Your husband is ready to commit one murder to remove the evident motive for another. And he's dragging you into this with him. You'll wind up an accessory before, after, and during the... You're running up a blind alley as fast as you can run. And it's too late to turn around, so I'll just have to keep running. Ah, well, here he is. Lace up your track shoes, lady. The race is on. Come in. Sit still, please, both of you. It's okay, Alice. You can hold off on the dog and pony show. Save it for the witnesses when they arrive. Don't waste it on Lawrence and me. That, that isn't Lawrence. What? Oh, so this must be Baron. You all through? Now, that depends on that gun in your hand. Where are the letters? Letters, letters, letters. You know, I'm beginning to feel like a mailman when he's late getting out in the morning. There's one thing I want to know. Where did an ugly part-time Romeo like you find all those pretty words you wrote? Look, don't get me tore. I'll blast your letters or no letters. Ah, that's the tone I was trying to bring your voice up to, Mr. Barron. No letters is exactly what I've got to offer. He's lying. He admitted to me that he has them. He's trying to blackmail you, Barron. That's what he's doing. Who are you? Never mind. My husband's in the same boat you are. I read the papers. Lawrence, huh? That's right. He'll be here any second. Between us, we'll figure out something. Now, stay away from it, darling. I'll answer it. Yeah, good idea. 
If a man answers, hang up. It'll be Lieutenant Roach. Uh, wait a minute. Okay, answer it, Ella. But the first wrong word fires this gun. Oh, you can believe me. Nothing but right words are on the tip of my tongue. Hello? Whoever was on the other end of the line decided not to talk and hung up. So I started an imaginary conversation with Lieutenant Roach of Homicide. While I was talking, I was thinking. Baron's voice was the voice I'd heard when I was locked in the closet. That made him the guy who shot the girl who turned me in. By the process of elimination, Lawrence Hill was elected murderer of Marilyn Major. During my talk, which made no sense, and my thoughts, which made plenty of sense, I was checking the length of cord on the phone. I needed Darren a little closer. So I started tossing enough dangerous words into the, the mouthpiece to draw him closer, threatening me with his mutters, his looks, and his gun. He moved into range, and I moved into action. I heaved the base of the telephone straight into his face. <laughs> I moved in with my knee right after it. I stumbled back, letting go of the gun, which I kicked under the bed. Then I made a break front out of the dresser next to the bed, using his head to break the front. The water from the cracked up pitcher hit him in the face, but it didn't do him any good. Hey, get out from underneath there. Get away from that gun. Come on. Well, I got a hold of your ankle. I got a good mind to do this thing right and heave you out the window. Let me let go of me. Come on now, stand up. You, you. All right, I'll let you once. We don't want any trouble. Just let me out of here. We'll pay you anything. My husband's an important man. So am I. I've had all the pushing around I'm going to take. From now on, I'm the dealer. And your hand is to shut up. All I want to do is get out of here. Oh, no, no, you don't. I baited you. You tried to bait me. Now we'll both sit here and bait your husband. That must have been him that called this room and hung up when he heard my voice. One thing I didn't bother to tell you. Your husband couldn't have known I was up here until then. Because I came in the hotel the back way. And came up here the back way. Elevator and all. What do you mean you, you baited me? Well, why do you think the police put my name, my address, and my picture in the newspapers? To draw autograph owners? Oh. Oh, is right. Now get over there in the corner while I retrieve Mr. Barron's gun from under the bed before some mouse crawls out of the woodwork and tries taking a shot at me. Go on, get going. Turn around. Okay. Now, if you don't want me shooting runs in your stocking, don't make a move while I'm under the bed. I feel like something that old maids hope for. Lawrence! Where is he? On the floor. He's got a gun. Shoot him. Kill him. Under the bed. No, no, Lawrence. Not him. No, he's under the bed. Under the bed. I'm taking no chances. Ow! Listen, Roach, you may be a lieutenant of the police department, but to me, you're just a big, fat private. Now, now, calm down, darling. I don't mind setting myself up as a pigeon, but you promised me protection. Where was it? Temper, temper. Now, who's who here? Let's get these stiffs sorted out, then we can talk. There's only one stiff. The other one, the one near the door, is Lawrence. He's only wounded. I had to shoot his pins out from under him. He came crashing in and killed Baron by mistake. That's Baron over there by the bed. Ah, another case of mistaken identity? How did he miss you? I happened to be under the bed at the time. Oh. And I wasn't hiding. No? I was looking for a gun, and I found it, and I used it. If I had one right now, I'm not so sure I wouldn't use it on you. You still haven't told me why you left me here alone, holding the sack all this time. I'll tell you why. And I guess it was our fault. The men I had posted in the lobby didn't see you come into the hotel. Well, how do you like that? Johnny Dollar. Wise guy. Huh? Lieutenant, I got some news for you. Just to make sure I was taking no chances, I came in the back way. Expense account, item eight. Sixty-two dollars. Hollywood entertainment. Seeing what there is to see at Pharaoh's. Item nine, a hundred and five dollars. Seeing to it that one of the things I saw at Ciro's had a good time with me at the Mocambo. Item 10, $186.13. Plane fare, Hollywood back to Hartford. Item 11, $1. Ticket to the movies, back in Hartford, to study the last motion picture of Marilyn Major, so that in the future I'd be sure to steer clear of her kind of a woman, who is too much of a jinx for my kind of man. Uh, expense account total... 
$948.76. Signed, yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> In keeping with the Easter season, you'll hear a different kind of story on CBS Gangbusters tomorrow night. The authentic story of a former gangster's fight to go straight, broadcast in cooperation with outstanding parole authorities. You'll find this Easter Eve Gangbusters drama as gripping as any program CBS has ever brought to you. Tomorrow night, you'll also find a mid-April adventure with the intriguing title, The Heat Wave, on CBS Philip Marlowe program. Gangbusters and The Adventures of Philip Marlowe are regular Saturday night pictures on most of these same CBS stations. Listen in again next week when CBS brings you yours truly, Johnny Dollar with Charles Russell as Johnny. Written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd with music by Mark Warno, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. You know, it's interesting, as always, we note the cost of the plane ticket. $186.13, a one-way ticket from uh, Hartford, Hartford to Hollywood. Well, I do want to let you know about Johnny Dollar Air, where you can get the best deals on uh, airline travel. Uh, and you can name your own price or choose from published fares, because it's, also, it's Priceline.com. And off of Priceline... I got $169. Now, of course, remember, $186.13 uh, was actually about $1302.91 in today's dollars. So that was an expensive trip uh, from Hollywood to Hartford. All right. Well, in as in regards to uh, and remember, JohnnyDollarAir.com. Uh, in regards to um, the show itself, it was kind of interesting. Uh, in one way, it was reminiscent of Pat Novak. You know, the private detective gets uh, accused by the police of murder. Of course, there were some differences. Mainly, it was nice to see him remain conscious throughout the whole uh, throughout the whole uh, event. Uh, it was a, it was a pretty good episode. There were a couple things. I, I have to say that when they got into the gunfight in the hotel room, when he was firing under the bed, I just totally lost lost track of it. It went too fast for my mental camera to keep up, I guess. Uh, I also have to say it was weird to have him actually trying to get tough with the police uh, and threaten them with uh, assault with a deadly weapon. I don't think I would recommend that, regardless of which dollar, uh, uh, Johnny Dollar incarnation uh, you happen to have. Uh, but uh, uh, another uh, another nice Charles Russell episode uh, in the books. So uh, we move on to some other comments. Um, we got some off Podcast Alley. And remember, please go and cast your vote at Podcast Alley. You can leave a comment if you'd like, but the votes are appreciated just as well. Uh, dear Adam, uh, I want to thank you for the trips down memory lane. I enjoy them immensely, writes Carson Holmes. And everything about great detectives is outstanding, including Adam's idiosyncratic yet informative comments. Idiosync. I've got to use that with the everyday man commentary. Oh, one other thing on the show uh, before I move on to a comment was this idea of uh, ensuring the likes. Um, the practice that they're actually, that the whole episode was based on, uh, it was based on a practice that began with 1940 with Betty Garble uh, insuring her legs. 
Um, now, leg insurance is actually still brought, bought by celebrities today. You purchase it through Lloyd's of London, um, which was uh, ironic because was, that was an original tie-in uh, to, uh, to, the, to, to, the, uh, to the character's name before they chose uh, uh, Johnny Dollar. Uh, but some of the celebrities that have got their legs insured uh, since uh, uh, Betty uh, uh, Grable started it, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, Angie Dickinson, Mary Hart uh, of uh, Entertainment Tonight, Angie Everhart, uh, Marlene Dietrich, Brooke Shields, Tina Turner, and actually the clothes show live, the, catwall, uh, the catwalk models, um, basically insisted on $50,000 in insurance on their legs before they go out wearing six-inch high heels. Uh, some men who've gotten it insured, and I think for pretty sensible reasons. Um, Fred Astaire, $75,000 per leg. Michael Flatley uh, of Riverdance, uh, $40 million. And David Beckham, uh, the English soccer player, has his legs insured for $70 million. And I think all of those are pretty understandable. Some of the some of the women, I have to say, I'm not certain. I see Mary Hart um, insuring her her legs. That that that's kind of um, or Brooke Shields for that matter. But a stare flatly Beckham, yeah, uh, absolute and and some of the dancers, absolutely, I can see that because um, uh, because anything can happen. Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> Uh, one of the things I found, she actually got it insured while um, uh, doing an ad for stockings. I generally don't think uh, wearing stockings would be that big of a threat to your likes. But anyway, we got one more comment here before we uh, end the show for this week. Jesse writes, I, I love both your Dragnet show and your great detectives of old-time radio. I've been listening to both since the beginning, and I really enjoy them both. <laughs> There is only one thing that I dislike. That is the Sherlock Holmes podcast. I am a Sherlock Holmes purist, and I dislike the portrayal that all the actors, excepting Basil Rathborn, who did an excellent job. Well, I definitely appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I think that, and one thing I found with these shows, we, we often will say, you know, the whole... A series of episodes like the Sherlock Holmes series, when there were multiple series and multiple actors, and some of them weren't particularly good. Uh, so I will definitely take a look. I I think we'll definitely we'll definitely play more than the Rathbone series, which we're going to be doing for about a year. And I hope everybody enjoyed getting to hear Basil Rathbone this week. Um, but there there may be some actors that are just a little bit off. Um, and, and I heard one version, I'm not going to say which one because I haven't rendered final judgment, where it was just really flat. So um, it, there may be some that we don't end up doing. Uh, but he writes, on a more upbeat beat note, I'm looking forward greatly to the app. My suggestion for the app would, be, would definitely be to have vi uh, videos. Um, do not like the idea of reading books on my uh, iPod. If you want to read Sherlock Holmes, then get the book. Um, and I understand the po the point on that. that the Kindle they've actually uh, they've actually designed it so you can read on the iPhone. So there are some people doing it. I'm not going to do it with the Sherlock Holmes story because I've looked into it a little further, and some of the Sherlock Holmes stories are actually under uh, copyright in the United States. The book form is so. I don't want to. I wouldn't even want to mess with it. But I've not heard anybody actually say they wanted that feature. Uh, he said, also, I have a suggestion for one of the shows reaches the end. Three shows that I greatly enjoy are The Shadow, Candy Matson, and Richard Diamond. Well, Candy Matson and Richard Diamond, absolutely, uh, definitely. Uh, Richard Diamond, it'll be a few years. Candy Matson, you'll hear uh, probably a, a little bit sooner. I'm thinking right after we do Richard Rogue, uh, which was... Uh, Richard, which was Dick Powell's prior series, and we do the Poirot series, then we'll do Candy Matson. Uh, so Candy Matson is definitely going to happen. The Shadow doesn't really fit with all the other detective shows. Uh, I think some of the m later episodes, the ones uh, with actors other than Wells, uh, may 
Orson Welles tend to tend to fit more into the detective genre, uh, but it's 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 really I think something different. I, I would need some different kind of uh, podcasting. I definitely don't want to run any shorter of uh, of brain power. And by the way, I will be getting my own uh, iPod. Finally, joining the iPod um, revolution, pod person uh, just I just bought it off of. Amazon. So, waiting for that to get there. So, I can kind of see how this app is going to work firsthand. It's, I told my wife, it's research. All right, well, that'll bring it to an end. Got any comments? Send them my way, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, also, please uh, cast your vote for us at podcast alley, podcast alley dot great detectives dot net. Uh, Final programming note I should add before we sign off. This uh, is actually the last show I'm recording for the year. So if you leave any comments uh, between Dece- uh, between December 13th and uh, and the end of the year, those will all be on next year's show. So be aware where we're getting them, and we will get to them. Uh, but we already recorded the Christmas episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, which will be next week. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.